Good afternoon. Welcome to the CDKL5 Deficiency Disorder Patient Focused Drug Development Meeting, or PFDD as we like to call it. My name is Karen Utley, and I am the president and co founder of the International Foundation for CDKL5 Research. <clears throat> and more importantly, I am mom to Samantha, my 13 year old daughter diagnosed with CDD. Just over a year ago, the Lulu Foundation and IFCR began discussions of hosting a PFDD meeting. With the emergence of early stage pipeline treatments for CDD, we felt this was a critical point for our community. We need research to be done with the patient in mind, informed by patients and their families' experiences and preferences. We put together a team from both of our organizations and we educated ourselves on what was involved and developed a letter of intent to host the meeting. Once we received the green light from the Food and Drug Administration, it was only the beginning. Many hours were spent planning and developing meeting content. Today, we are so excited to all come together in such a powerful and meaningful way. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for our community. This meeting will allow us to tell our story. We will be able to help FDA officials and leaders in industry gain a glimpse into the lives of those affected by CDD. Today, you are going to hear from two panels comprised of parents and caregivers. And these individuals will speak for their loved ones that cannot speak for themselves. Then our families in the audience will have a chance to share their experiences as well. I would like to take a moment and thank all of the FDA officials that have taken the time to join us in person and via the webcast. We realize that you are all very busy and we want you to know that we appreciate you taking the time to learn about CDD. In addition, I want to thank Ovid Therapeutics, Marinus Pharm Pharmaceuticals, and Zogenics for their sponsorships to assist with travel expenses to enable family members to participate in this historical day for our community. Most importantly, I want to thank all of the families that have traveled to be here today. It's a challenge in our community, as well as all of the families that have joined via the webcast. Your participation is what will make this event impactful. Today will not be easy for us. However, I want to encourage each of you to participate fully through the opportunities to speak as well as by answering the polling questions. I would like to take a moment and explain why I'm saying it will not be easy. As mom to a 13-year-old girl diagnosed with CDD, one of the hardest things for me to do is talk about the burden of the illness. You see, each of us parents love and adore our child, and we do not see them as a burden. I know firsthand how hard it can be to face the reality of your situation. Many of us choose to pursue a positive path and focus on the joy and inspiration that we get from our loved one. This meeting is organized in a way that the panelists will give their statements and then questions will be asked for audience participation. These will be tough questions about the worst parts of living with CDD. Today, it is of utmost importance for us to share the challenges, grief, and pain that this disorder causes our families. I encourage each of you to be honest open and vulnerable. The only way that we can express the true impact of CDD to the FTA and drug developers is to communicate the raw and ugly side of CDD. This will not only be hard for us to do, but it will also be hard for many of you to hear. I ask you to please give us your undivided attention and to have compassion for how difficult this is for our families. <clears throat> when your child is diagnosed with a disorder such as CDD, your world 
changes. I have described our diagnosis moment as me feeling like I was drowning, literally in a body of water with waves crashing over my head and taking my breath away. In the beginning, all I wanted to do was stop the seizures and help Samantha. However, as she grew, it became crystal clear that this disorder is not simply an epilepsy. <clears throat> Accepting the reality of the situation and understanding that short of a treatment and a cure, your child will not develop into an independent adult is a crushing blow. All of us not only deal with the fear of losing our child, we have another fear that I think is almost greater, and that is the fear of our children outliving us. No parent should have to face these types of fears. We are in desperate need of disease-modifying treatments, and the approval of this type of treatment will require well-chosen measures to capture treatment benefits in, cl in clinical trials. This is a daunting reality, and we must remedy this quickly. We need the FDA and decisive bodies of government to understand fully that small improvements in our population can make a large impact on the quality of life. Perhaps a treatment could target hand use and assist with self-feeding or give the ability to touch an area to indicate the source of pain. A change in communication abilities could allow a child to inform a parent that a seizure is coming. Improvement in bowel motility could allow parents to stop obsessing with the amount and quality of stool. A decrease in apraxia could allow for more control of the body that they are trapped in. Please, I ask you to never underestimate the value of small changes. Today, you are going to hear many sides to the community story. There will be commonalities, and yet there will also be uniqueness in each family story. One of the purposes of this day is to make it very clear that seizures are not the only challenge our kids face. Stopping seizures will not be a cure. This disorder impacts our kids greatly and globally. You will hear this sentiment repeated throughout the day. Please understand that although CDD is certainly neurological in its origin, the impact creates symptoms in many body systems. Today is the beginning of what we hope will be great change in our community because all of you will have a meaningful understanding of the need for urgency as well as the broad daily impact on the patient and the family. So with that being said, I would like to introduce our next speaker that will be making the opening remarks for the meeting, Dr. Michelle Campbell. She is the Senior Clinical Analyst for Stakeholder Engagement and Clinical Outcomes for the Division of Neurology Products. That means she takes a look at what's important to us, what's gonna matter. She's the person that needs to hear our message. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, I lost my place, I'm gonna be honest. So I'm gonna turn it over to her. <laughs> Well, thank you, and good afternoon. My name is Michelle Campbell, and I lead stakeholder engagement and clinical outcomes in the Division of Neurology Products in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. I'm happy to see so many uh, patients, caregivers, and advocates in the audience today, and I know there's a whole uh, amount of people as well online. Thank you for being a part of this meeting and sharing your experiences with us. I would also like to thank the International Foundation for CDK5L Research, and the Lulu Foundation, and all the staff that was involved in planning this meeting. 
I know we also have some representation today from industry, academia, and other medical product development stakeholders in the room and as well as online. While FDA plays a critical role in the medical product development, we are just one part of the process, and I'm glad to see a high level of interest from those of you who also play an important role. Additionally, we have colleagues from various offices and centers from the FDA attending in person and on the web. And for us in person, we may be in that, somewhere in that back row vicinity. Um, but um, we've uh, joined you today to hear your message. We share the patient's community and commitment to facilitate the developments of safe and effective medical products for CDD. Know when we say medical product development, we mean it in the broadest sense of identifying developing, and evaluating potential therapies or devices that can help patients manage their condition. We are here to learn from you and your experiences with CDD. FDA protects and promotes the public health by evaluating the safety, effectiveness, and quality of new products, but we do not develop medical products or conduct clinical trials. It is, however, FDA's responsibility to ensure that the benefits outweigh the risks. Therefore, having this kind of dialogue is extremely valuable for us because hearing from patients and what you care about helps us figuring out the best way to facilitate medical product development and understand how patients views the benefits and risks of therapies and devices with CDD. We look forward to incorporating what we learned today into the agency's thinking and understanding of how patients and their caregivers view benefits and risks of therapies and devices for CDD. We thank you for your participation. We are grateful for each one of you for being here and sharing your personal stories, experiences, and perspectives. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Tim Banke. Dr. Banke serves as the Pontio Family Endowed Chair in Neurology Research at the University of Colorado in combination with the Children's Hospital Colorado. He is the leader of our Colorado CDKL5 Center of Excellence. But more importantly, he's a doctor who sees value in our kids and loves them. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Tim Benke. I'm a scientist and pediatric neurologist at Children's Hospital Colorado, medical director of the RET Clinic, and lead uh, the site for the IFCR Centers of Excellence. I have personally evaluated nearly 70 patients with CDKL5 deficiency disorder, or CDD. These are my disclosures, but none have influenced today's content. So I'm going to give a historical perspective on CDD review molecular aspects of the cyclin-dependent kinase like 5 gene and protein, discuss the clinical aspects of CDD, and cap with the unmet clinical needs. CDKL5 deficiency disorder, or CDD, is what we call a developmental encephalopathy, which means that the symptoms, not just neurological, change with age. Genetic alterations in the CDKL5 gene uh, were first linked with human disease in 2004 through cohorts of patients seen in RET clinics that were found to not have alterations in the RET gene MECP2. These patients were initially ascribed to have a RET syndrome variant, but more detailed study uh, and experience determined that this really is a unique disease through seminal work by Dr. Leonard's group in 2013. Uh, these patient cohorts were assembled and assessed through combinations of smaller uh, case series and family surveys. Recently, we confirmed the unique nature of CDD through our work with the IFCR Centers of Excellence through the use of a uniform clinical data collection instrument in over 92 patients. The CDKL5 protein has six major domains. Oh, I'm not sure. So these are the major domains here. Uh, in the one here in green is, is probably the most important. While nonsense or protein truncating changes coded by mutations in the CDKL5 gene are all disease causing, missense changes coded by mutations associated with the kinase domain are equally disease causing. 
Recent studies have determined a birth instance of disease causing CDKL5 mutations in 1 in 41,000 births. Prevalence has been more difficult to determine and has everything to do with access to genetic testing. While at least 500 patients are known through Facebook, and we have seen now about 175 in the centers of excellence, we estimate from the Colorado experience the prevalence is at least one in 75,000 because of our single referral center and our high access to genetic testing. The role and function of the CDKL5 protein is still emerging. It is a kinase localized to the nucleus of all cells and to synapses, the chemical connections between neurons in the brain. Evidence suggests that CDKL5 as a kinase phosphorylates MECP2 and DNMT1, proteins involved in DNA methylation in the nucleus. And at synapses, it phosphorylates EB2, NGL1, and amphiphysin. These are proteins involved in synaptic structure. At synapses, it also binds and interacts with several st synaptic structural elements, such as PSD95. Genetic manipulations that knock out or reduce CDKL5 protein in rodent models negatively impact rodent behavior, visual function, and synaptic functions. Despite some limitations, these models support small molecule and large molecule therapeutic approaches. So far, this supports the suggested diagnostic criteria for CDD clinical trials. Broadly, inclusion is any alteration of the CDKL5 gene and confirmation that the alteration is pathogenic. Exclusion would be duplication of the CDKL5 gene. Based on our experience, in the IFCR CDD Centers of Excellence, where, as I've said, we've now seen about 175 patients. Here is our experience. The disease typically presents with epilepsy, beginning as early as two weeks of life, which is medically refractory. This often includes infantile and later epileptic spasms that persist throughout life. Interestingly, and consistent with this being a developmental encephalopathy, many have a seizure honeymoon around one to two years of age that lasts up to 12 months. With the epilepsy diagnosis and evaluation by a pediatric neurologist, the other impactful features are discovered. Cortical visual impairment, severe and global developmental delays, slow development of hand use, and very low muscle tone or hypotonia. Other features emerge later in life, which include movement disorders, severe all-night party sleep disturbances, irregular breathing, swallow dysfunction, severe reflux and constipation. These features can have different tolls on different parts of the body, such as chronic aspiration pneumonia and scoliosis, often severe enough to require surgical correction. It is important to point out that not everyone is the same and that there is indeed a spectrum of severity. Some, not many of our patients walk, talk, and have functional hand use. We have found that this is not affected by certain types of, or groups of mutations or sex. Epilepsy can, though rarely, improve with age. In our older patients, hypotonia may evolve into dystonia with Parkinsonian features. Some of these I've successfully treated with dopamine replacement. Importantly, there are many non-neurological features that require the attention of pulmonologists, gastroenterologists, and orthopedic specialists. And this leads off our list of unmet needs. Our patients need access to a range of specialists not just neurologists, but pediatric neurologists and epilepsy specialists, ophthalmologists that recognize cortical visual impairment, pulmonologists, GI specialists, orthopedists that can each manage handicapped children. Experience with CDD is always a plus. Access to both genetic testing and a good genetic counselor to explain the test and the results is absolutely critical to diagnosis. Therapists for physical, occupational speech, augmentative communication, and educational vision services are required. Because this disease is more than just epilepsy, therapeutics that address intellectual impairment, cortical visual impairment, sleep, movement, GI, swallowing, and medically refractory epilepsy are all needed where none currently exist. In summary, we could not bring this to you without our patients and families with CDD. It's important to recognize their dignity. We ask their, for their forgiveness when we've gotten it wrong, but we recognize their personalities, 
their teenage eye rolls at their mothers, when they snuggle with their brothers, and the rest of it. We have a good, great team in Colorado as well as with our partners around the globe that have been able to bring this to you today. So thanks very much. So we're fortunate enough today to be introducing you to not only one physician that has love and compassion for our children, but two. Our next, our next speaker, speaker is Dr. Oren Davinsky, Professor of Neurology and Neurosurgery and Psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine and leader of our CDKL5 Center of Excellence in New York. Thank you, Karen, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here and, and share my views on CDD. To echo what Tim and Karen have said, CDD is a devastating disorder and it is unique among neurologic conditions. I care for many thousands of children, primarily with epilepsy, and it ranges the gamut of undiagnosed disorders to children who have a gene disorder known in only one or five other children in the world. But among all those disorders, CDD stands out as unique. Okay, advance my slides. I'm going backwards. Okay, got it. The big green button. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So, two major problems which you've already heard about and I think will be the subject of many more presentations today are severe epilepsy that does not extinguish despite every therapy that's available to modern science today and global developmental delays that affect every aspect of development, motor function, intellectual function, behavioral function, and physical function. And those are devastating. As Dr. Benke related, there are many other major categories which, depending on the child, can be the paramount and most influential ones that disable the child, but they include GI issues, musculoskeletal issues, visual issues, and autonomic issues. The number of physicians, therapists, nurses, and different healthcare providers involved in the care of people with CDD is at least the 17 professions listed here on the slide. But I must say there are many more that end up getting involved. And I think as the parents know better than either Tim or myself who try to coordinate these, the coordination and integration of care and recommendations with a GI doctor recommending a bowel prep for the child, how does that interact with medications that are given for muscular disorders or epilepsy? They're very complicated and integrating the care uh, is best done at a center of excellence, but even there I think we have a long way to go. The epilepsy phenotype, which is my own expertise, is an extraordinarily difficult one to control, and I think we have all, through the period of time we've known what CDD is and treated it, have really thrown at least all 20 of the medications that we have available to treat seizure disorders. We've used neuromodulatory therapies like vagus nerve stimulation. We use dietary therapies. But the reality is none of those therapies has proven close to successful. There are typically the three stages, the first one, being spasms beginning very, very early in life, typically one of the earliest presentations of infantile spasms, again, a relatively unique feature of CDD. Then it evolves into an epileptic encephalopathy where the child then develops cognitive and behavioral delays, and sometimes the sparkle in their eyes slowly starts to fade as seizures and EEG abnormalities become relentless and neurologists like myself pour more medications on to try to put the seizure fire out. And then finally, they evolve into a treatment-resistant epilepsy, sometimes after a relative honeymoon phase, as Tim mentioned, where seizures come under better control. And then once they come back, they often remain refractory to everything we do. There is one sequence of seizures described in CDD patients, which has not been seen with any other genetic or non-genetic pediatric epilepsy. It's a hypermotor seizure with rapid movements followed by stiffening and then spasms in a 
very stereotypic sequence. So again, one of the features that points, and I think in some ways confirms, that this gene does cause a unique phenotype in these children. And it's not reasonable to compare it to other genetic disorders or other non-genetic disorders. As I said, for epilepsy, the first thing we do is we use the standard anti-seizure medications. If they have spasms, we'll use ACTH or Vigabatrin. After that is a lot of different views based on different doctors. And even within that, because the response rate is so poor, it's really been hard to ferret out, even from large collaborative efforts among the centers of excellence, to find which drugs truly are relatively more effective. But the other side of the equation, as I said, one of the most devastating parts of CDD is the effect on cognitive, motor, and behavior development. And as pediatric epileptologists add more and more drugs at higher and higher doses to extinguish seizures, we often extinguish part of the child's personality and cognition in the, in the process. So we're left with this impossible balancing act between seizures and the side effects of the medications we prescribe. There are other therapies for CDD, but to date we have almost no data to support that any of them are any more effective than the drugs, which are terribly ineffective. What do we do for the most severe problem facing these children, their global developmental delays? Well, certainly we know when seizures are controlled, and many parents can comment on this, you know, relative periods of seizure freedom when drugs are not too high, are associated often with cognitive and motor and behavioral gains. The children are more responsive, they're more interactive, there's more sparkle in their eyes, they're more connected. But when seizures come back, those things may be lost. As we go up on the seizure meds, those things may be lost. So currently, the state of medicine is a very bad place for these children. There are many therapies that are beneficial for these children but in a relatively measured sense. And then there are symptomatic therapies for behavioral disorders, from attentional problems, GI disorders like constipation or lack of GI motility, uh, and many other therapies that can be targeted, but they're symptomatic. And to date, we have no targeted or effective therapies for CDD. So unlike a disorder like tuberous sclerosis, where we have mTOR inhibitors, that can literally specifically reverse the abnormality caused by the gene defect. We don't have anything close to that today in CDD. We have no way to modify disease outcome, no way to counteract the underlying problem that affects these children. On a positive note, at least four different drug companies have become involved in treating epilepsy in CDD, uh, ganalaxone, is a drug that is currently in a double-blind randomized trial, phase three. Adalurin is a premature stop codon read-through, small molecule that's being used to treat eight patients. That trial is over, and we'll hopefully have a readout on that data in the next month or two. TAK-935 is another drug with a novel mechanism of action, which is being used to treat children with CDD. And then finally, there's a small open label 10-patient trial of fenfluramine, which has been a breakthrough therapy for Dravet syndrome and hopefully Lennox-Gastaut syndromes. But all of these are really epilepsy therapies. They're not CDD therapies. They're just other drugs targeting seizures in children with CDD. I hope they're all effective when the data's in, uh, but we'll see. None of, none of them have completed their trials to date. So what are our unmet needs? They're basically everything at this point. We have these anticonvulsants, but it's unclear to what extent they really improve other therapies, and we do a terrible job at seeing how much harm they do. Uh, Long-term, these drugs can cause a variety of problems from irritability and aggressiveness, inattention, decreased muscle tone, impaired GI mo mobility, um, the list goes on and on. So, you know, we need better drugs. We also need to figure out epilepsy trial designs that look at outcomes beyond seizures. Because if we improve seizures but devastate cognition, I would not call that a good therapy. But right now, understandably, all of the primary outcome measures for these trials are seizure frequency. So we need better criteria to even evaluate the efficacy of the anti-seizure drugs that we're using now. And we need to develop 
and have ways to measure disease-modifying therapies. One fear I have, which is in some ways a good problem, is from the Drave experience. For Drave syndrome, there's now been two drugs that I hope, one drug approved, Epidiolex or CBD, and another drug, fenfluramine, that has had exceptionally positive results in randomized trials that I strongly hope the FDA approves uh, when it's presented to them in the coming future. But what that will do is that when there are disease-modifying therapies, as Stoke Therapeutics has an ASO treatment that they're anxious to use in patients with Dravet syndrome, they were always planning on counting seizures. But by the time Epidiolex and Fintepla hit the market, which will be probably well before their trial begins, they won't be able to count seizures so readily because seizures, hopefully, will be relatively infrequent. So in Dravet syndrome, which they're doing, which I think is a great idea, they're looking at other measures of the natural history and how their therapy can intervene. We need to do similar things in CDD so we don't get focused on the epilepsy. And then if epilepsy actually responds well, we may actually have a therapy that reverses CDD, but it will fail in a trial because we don't have an adequate primary outcome measure. So that's an, another enormous unmet need that we don't have those measures today. So ultimately, we have many unmet needs. We need to do better at diagnosis when we need better outcome measures, most importantly, to see how these kids do in their big picture. Some of the potential disease-modifying therapies that are being explored at this time include a protein or enzyme replacement therapy, gene therapy, of which there are a variety of different types, but ultragenics and amicus are leading this, read-through strategies, since about 20% of CDD are due to premature stop codons, small molecules, transfer RNAs, there are a variety of approaches to this, and then potential targets to reactivate X chromosomes or gene editing or antisense oligonucleotides. So I think the future certainly holds a lot of promise, but at the moment I think it speaks to the failure of the medical community as a community to do much to help these children. Thank you very much. So we will be transitioning to the next section, and I'm going to introduce James Valentine. He has been working with us to plan and organize the PFDD meeting over the past year. He will be serving as our moderator, and I want to assure all of you that we are in good hands because previously he worked at the FDA where he helped start the PFDD program, and he has organized and led two-thirds of all the externally led meetings. So now I turn it over to you. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to be your moderator uh, and to be working with you all for the remainder uh, of our program today to help really build upon uh, the foundation that was just set by our opening speakers, to help characterize the burdens of living with CDD and the unmet needs that exist in hopes that we can uh, design clinical trials and outcome measures that will actually capture things that are important to you uh, patients and, and family members and caregivers of individuals living with CDKL5 deficiency disorder. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Karen for opening the meeting, Dr. Campbell for giving the perspective of the FDA of the importance of this event, Drs. Benke and uh, Demoninsky for giving us the clinical background and scientific background on CDKL5 deficiency disorder, or as you'll hear this community refer to it sh by shorthand, as either CDD or simply sometimes CDKL5, which is the affected gene. Today is a systematic way for us to gather patient and caregiver perspectives and experiences with CDD, as well as to assess available treatment options. As you heard from FDA's Dr. Campbell, your input can help inform the FDA's understanding of CDD to help inform drug development and review. Uh, which will also be of great value to the drug developers both in the room and on the web today. This is a very unique opportunity uh, to have this type of meeting. As you may or may not know, there are uh, over 7,000 known just rare diseases alone. And this afternoon marks the 32nd externally led PFDD meeting. So I'd like to now uh, share with you, uh, introduce what our agenda will look like for the rest of the day, so you know what to expect. 
Uh, we'll start with what are we discussing? Well, we've organized this meeting into two topics. Uh, the first topic we will tackle is understanding the disease symptoms and health effects of CDD and the impacts uh, that they have on your daily lives. And then we're gonna build on that topic by then getting an understanding of current challenges to treatment for CDD. In order to uh, try to understand those two topics, we have uh, a few different methods we're gonna use together here in the room. We're gonna be starting off uh, with each of our topics by hearing from a panel of caregivers. The idea here is uh, each of the caregivers are gonna be sharing their experiences on the given topic, sending, setting a good foundation for the discussion that we'll be having with you all in the room. Uh, the panelists were selected to reflect a range of experiences with CDD, uh, and we expect to even expand beyond that as we move to those of you that are here in the room today. We'll broaden our discussion uh, after our panels by going to uh, some live polling. Um, so you'll be using your phones, or if you have a tablet and laptop and uh, choose to do so, can use those devices. For those of you on the web, you'll be able to use your uh, home computers or, or your phone, cell phones if you pr prefer. Um, and I'll be giving instructions on how to do that. But through those polling questions, we'll be asking some questions to help broaden the discussion, get a sense of the experiences and preference we have uh, re uh, represented here in the room and on the web as well as primarily to aid in our discussion um, by having that understanding of the experiences we have, uh, we can then dig deeper with all of you here uh, and, and get that more context and understanding. So that leads to our, our third method, which is our facilitated audience discussion. Um, I will be uh, facilitating a discussion with all of our caregivers here in the room, building on the panel discussion and polling questions. I'll be asking specific discussion questions and inviting you to raise your hand uh, to uh, provide your responses, your experiences to those questions. I just ask that when you raise your hand, just wait to be called on. Please state your name if called on uh, and uh, wait for a microphone uh, before responding. And finally, uh, whether you're here in the room today uh, or on the web, um, we have an additional opportunity for you to provide input through our survey, which is available on, our, on the PFDD website, which is www.cdkl5.com forward slash PFDD. Uh, that survey will be available for another 30 days. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to do that, we recommend that you do, because all of today's input here in the room, as well as all of the survey input that we receive, will be summarized in the voice of the patient report, uh, which will be provided both to the FDA as well as product developers and just be generally available to the public. Before we go into our first set of polling questions, which will just be on some demographic information, I wanna go through a couple of ground rules for today's discussion. First and foremost, I really wanna encourage all of our caregivers and family members in the room um, of, member, of individuals affected with CDD to please contribute to the dialogue. Um, this is our, our unique and important opportunity to hear from all of you. Uh, so this is your chance to speak up and be heard. That being said, we have other stakeholders here in the room today. We have FDA officials, we have drug developers and clinicians. They're here to listen. So they won't be asking questions. I'll be the only one asking questions, nor will they be responding to questions. When you're providing your input, um, your views are, of course, uh, going to be inherently personal. Um, and the discussion may, given the topic, get emotional. So respect for one another is paramount. Um, we expect that there, uh, as Karen said, there will be both commonalities in your experiences and your preferences, but also divergent experiences. And so we wanna make sure that uh, all different views are able to be voiced. And to that end, uh, we do ask that you try to be focused and concise in your comments, so that way we can hear as many voices as possible in the limited time that we have today. So with all of that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, go ahead and pull out your phones or tablets and laptops. We're gonna go to our set of demographic polling questions, get a sense of who's participating in our meeting today. So if you go, uh, it's displayed on the top of this uh, slide here, but if you go to the website, www.pollev.com forward slash CDKL5, you'll be able to access the polling questions. This is for our Family members and caregivers only, please. And if you're having any trouble accessing the polling, please raise your hand and one of our team members will come and help you access that. 
So this is for all of our caregivers here in the room as well as following along online. Please raise your hand if you are having any difficulties. So we're gonna go through these questions fairly quickly. They should be uh, easy. Uh, the ones that come a little later in the program might be a little bit more difficult uh, and require more thought. But here we wanna know where do you currently reside? Your options are A, the US Northeast, B, the US Midwest, C, the US South, D, the US West, E, the US Pacific, F, Mexico or Canada, or G, if outside of North America. And again, this will include all of our in-person as well as web uh, participants. Was there, a, sorry, was there a question or an issue? Could someone assist right here in the middle of the room? Ed, or, yep. Just give me a thumbs up. So today we'll not be able to break out uh, who's in the room versus on the web, um, but given our current results, I'll go ahead and start uh, sharing those. Um, so perhaps not surprisingly, given the location, physical location of our meeting, we have greatest representation, about a third of our participants being from the U.S. Northeast. However, we do have good representation from uh, across the U.S. We have represented, representation from the Midwest, the South, the West, as well as the Pacific. Um, and uh, interesting, we also have good representation from out of the U.S., uh, perhaps um, a signal to this international patient community that exists and the fact that uh, they may be following along online. So if we go to our next polling question. So this question is, do you live in an A, a city, B, a rural area, or C, a suburban area? Just give you a few moments to respond to this question. So it looks like just about half of, half of our participants today live in suburban areas. Uh, a little under a third of our participants, or around a third, uh, live in a city. And then we do have some representation, about 10% from a rural area. Go to our third demographic question. So this question, uh, uh, Please respond whether your child is A, male, or B, female. And although our questions are all worded to be about your child, if you are a grandparent uh, or a sibling or other caregiver uh, of an individual CDD, we, uh, please respond for that individual. So it looks like uh, just about 80% of the uh, individuals with CDD that we have represented by their caregivers uh, here today are, are females, uh, and about 17% of individuals are male. We we'll go to our next polling question. So here we would like to know, what is your child's race or ethnicity? Your options are A, uh, American Indian or Alaskan Native, B, Asian, C, Black or African American, D, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, E, multiracial, F, white, or G, other. Please select that which best represents your child's race or ethnicity. So 
So while final results might are trickling in, it looks like our uh, largest representation, about 80%, are uh, white. After that, we do have representation from multiracial, Asian, and African Americans, uh, as well as some other uh, race or ethnicities not listed on the slide. Does not look like we have representation from American Indians uh, or Native Hawaiians or other Pacific Islanders. Next question. This question is, at what age did your child have his or her first seizure? And the options here are A, was the first seizure within the first month of age, B, between one and three months of age, C, between six and one year of age, D, between one and two years of age, or E, after two years of age. This is the age of first seizure. Final results trickle in. It looks like uh, the greatest experience of our individuals with CDD represented today are as seizures within the first month of age, a little over half. Um, we have a, then about a third that had their first seizure between one and three months, and then about a little under 10%, between five and 10%, between six months and one year. Uh, no one reported having a first seizure between one and two years, and we had some small representation of those who had their first seizure after two years of age. Next question. So this uh, question is at what, which age was your child diagnosed with CDD? Uh, and so the same age response options are A, before three months, B, between three and six months, C, between six and one, months and one year, D, between one year and two years, or E, after two years of age. So this was the age of diagnosis with CDD. So as the results are trickling in, I think as you compare our responses to the last question of time of first seizure to this, the time of diagnosis, uh, you're seeing a, almost an inverse uh, response rate uh, with uh, the greatest response here being diagnosis after f two years of age um, although and whereas and the least or the lowest response rate being before three months of age whereas that was flipped for time of first seizure and can we go to our final demographic polling question and now we'd like to know how old is your child today presently? A, less than one year of age, B, between one to two years, C, between three to five years, D, between six to 10 years, E, between 11 and 18 years, or F, greater than 19 years of age today. So given that there were so few that were diagnosed within the uh, early months of life, uh, perhaps it's not surprising that we don't have any individuals represented for less than one year of age currently. Um, our greatest representation is individuals aged 11 to 18 years, followed closely behind those both between three and five and six and 10 years. Uh, also good representation in those aged one to two. Um, and we do have representation of those older than 19. So thank you very much for participating in our uh, demographic polling. Always good to get a sense of who we have represented both in the room and on the web. At this point, I'll invite our first panel to the stage as we transition into our first topic for this afternoon's uh, discussion. So panelists, don't be shy. Come on up. Um, so our first topic, uh, we're going to be discussing um, symptoms and daily impacts of living with CDD. So here we're gonna be, uh, through our panel discussion as well as our polling and audience discussion, exploring those symptoms and health effects of CDD that have the greatest impact on you and your children. Um, we wanna understand how those different symptoms and health effects impact activities that are important um, to your child and, and for your child, um, how those impacts might 
change and vary, whether that be day to day, week to week, month to month, or over the course of years, the progression of the disease. And we also want to know not just the impact for today, but also what it is, what it is that worries you most uh, about the future for your children living with CDD. So to get us uh, started on this topic, we have a great panel for you. We have Deanna, Jenny, Marissa, Kathy, and Rick who are going to be sharing their and their children's stories. So I'll ask Deanna to go ahead and kick it off for us. Imagine waking up each morning not knowing if you'll be able to see, hear, walk, talk, or eat that day. Oh, and you're living on a sailboat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in the middle of a storm. Welcome to Life with CDKL5 Deficiency Disorder. My name is Diana. I am mom to 17-month-old Lena Isabel from Front Royal, Virginia, and our family has been braving the stormy weather for about 14 months. Lena started having seizures before she was five weeks old, and at the age of three and a half months, she was diagnosed with CDD. We were given a grim prognosis. Not only will she likely never walk, talk, feed herself, or achieve seizure freedom, but her life itself may be at risk. Despite this, she continued to develop, rolling, holding her head up in tummy time, cooing, and tracking and reaching for certain objects. We were encouraged and dared to hope until about six months in when progress came to a halt. Lena spent weeks in a constant state of lethargy and ir irritability, not utilizing her skills or interacting with us. Eventually, some of her personality and skills resurfaced, but not for long. Another period of similar loss occurred a few short months later. Currently, we're on the third iteration of skill acquisition, and she's working hard on her vision and motor skills. Our family focuses a lot on skill acquisition because Lena's cortical visual impairment, her fine and gross motor skills deficits, and her profound intellectual disability were the things we thought had the biggest impact on her quality of life. Lena's inability to see means that she's not motivated to reach, to, to reach or to move towards a goal. She does not make eye contact or interact visually with the world around her, which makes it hard for her to connect socially. Her motor deficits mean she cannot enjoy the textures and sounds of objects around her because she cannot reach them if they are outside of her immediate vicinity, nor can she hold them unless they have very specific shapes and sizes. More importantly, her intellectual disability makes it hard for her to help us understand her needs and to navigate her world by learning and applying knowledge. For instance, if a toy drops from her hand, it may as well have fallen off the edge of the world. She does not appear to miss it once it is gone or reach for it to get it back. Sometimes I wonder if she feels the same way about me, her own mother, when I leave the room. I used to think that life would be immeasurably better if any or all of these abilities could be improved. However, recently things took a turn that made me question everything I thought I wanted for her. In short, Lena stopped eating. She was always a great eater, and even on other occasions when we struggled, she never flat out refused to open her mouth. However, this time she stubbornly pressed her lips shut every time I approached her with a bottle. We were not sure if this is because of teething, severe constipation, or the progression of the disease, and we realized later it was surprisingly related to her treatment management. Regardless, it landed us back in the hospital. At this point, our priorities shifted considerably as we are reminded that life preservation itself cannot be taken for granted in CDD. I do not care anymore if she meets her therapy goals, if she's able to make eye contact or even hold her head up. All I want is for her to eat or at least drink a little water. Having to constantly choose between priorities, goals, and targets has been destabilizing for our family both emotionally and strategically. We cannot focus on developing her vision when she's screaming in pain from constipation. We cannot work on eating solids when she will not drink water. We cannot read or play with her when she's disconnected from the world around her. Every treatment decision that we make seems to have detrimental effects in other areas. We chased seizure freedom by meddling with her medication and medical diet, and we obtained it temporarily at the price of refusal to eat or drink. The weekly blood draws she has to endure revealed that this refusal led to acidosis, hypoglycemia, and hyperketosis. We learned that seizures are not the most harmful aspect of her condition, as on many seizure days, she's still energetic and playful, while she paradoxically spends some seizure-free days sleeping or fussing. Our new goals sound something like this. 
We would like for her to function at the highest level possible from a visual, motor, and intellectual point of view and have the fewest possible seizures, but only if this does not affect life-sustaining functions. Sounds super simple and feasible, right? Looking at our past experience and our future goals, it seems that instead of moving in a forward trajectory, we travel in circles. Sometimes we circle forward, sometimes backward, but I invariably recognize the places we're passing as places where we have already been. We are not sure what will happen tomorrow, which makes it very hard to plan or develop expectations. Although he didn't know it, when the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, change is the only constant in life, he was describing life with CDD. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and share our story. My name is Jenny Feynman. I live in Greenwood, Indiana with my husband, Steve. We have three children. Nicholas is 14, Hannah is 12, and Allison is seven. Three weeks after a typical healthy birth, our youngest daughter, Allie, suffered through 11 seizures in one day. Over the next four months, we frantically searched for answers as the seizures could not be controlled. Finally, after a full spectrum of genetic testing, we received the official diagnosis of CDKL5 deficiency disorder. At that time, we were told there were only 900 confirmed cases of CDKL5 in the world, and unfortunately, there was very little information to help us understand what this diagnosis meant for Allie and for us as a family. Fast forward through many more ER visits, doctor consultations, and numerous EEGs, Allie's neurology team told us that we would have a very difficult time controlling her seizures with medication. Her test results showed that she was at risk for every type of seizure, thus turning any medication and the side effects into a game of chance. We tried our best to keep diaries of her seizure activity, hoping somehow we would unlock a secret pattern that could be used as a pathway to treatment, but no such luck. Allie's seizure activity started as three to four one-minute-long episodes each day, with most occurring during the day. By seven months old, her seizures became a little less frequent, but longer in duration, having a couple more per day but lasting 10 to 13 minutes each, and would often happen in the middle of the night. By eight months old, Allie was having one long seizure every day, lasting 15 to 20 minutes. They seemed to be at their worst when Allie fell asleep, and she would wake up screaming as if in excruciating pain. The screaming associated with these episodes was incredibly alarming to us as her parents, and even more terrifying to her brother and sister. During this time, the lack of normal achievements became glaring. Allie wasn't smiling, there was no visual tracking of objects, she would not even grasp her toys, she would not engage. Our beautiful daughter would not even look at us as we held her. <clears throat> Looking back on the first two years of her life, we thought the worst was behind us, but we were wrong. Round two of CDKL5 begins. We adapted, if you can call it that, to life with seizures. But when Allie was three, she started significant crying and sometimes even screaming spells. Uncontrollable and inconsolable screaming and whole body thrashing. This period lasted several months. Her doctors thought this was a new form of seizure activity, but medicines were not making any difference. We again did our best to adapt. Keep in mind, we are a family of five. God love our other children as they endured many family dinners with sounds of their sister screaming in the background and many, many sleepless nights. We would have to remove Allie from the room just to try and have a conversation. As a parent, this was heartbreaking. Once it reached the point that Allie stopped eating and would barely drink, we drove to the ER and said, we're not leaving until someone can tell us why our daughter seems to be in so much pain and now won't eat. During the exam, they couldn't find anything of significance. It was upon reviewing a whole body bone scan that they saw a small glimpse of her stomach and that it was significantly impacted. After numerous stool softeners, laxatives, and enemas, 
Allie finally got some relief. Thirteen diapers later, the screaming had stopped and we could once again find some reprieve. Allie had gotten back to quote normal baseline and we were able to sit together as a family and enjoy quiet conversation. As you can see, there are many facets to CDKL5, but there is another side to this disorder that is often a secondary concern. As caregivers, we are subjected to unimaginable mental and physical stress. We want the best for our children and spend every minute trying to figure out how to make it better. The mental fatigue combined with the physical stress of caring for an immobile child and the many sleepless nights definitely takes a toll on the body. Earlier this year, I was diagnosed with a cardiac issue known as PVCs, which are increased irregular heartbeats. I was told this condition was the direct result of stress and lack of sleep. Fortunately, I was able to have a surgery which involved cauterizing several areas of my heart and am back to normal heart health. If this is how my body reacted to the stress effects of CDKL5, can you imagine the amount of stress Allie's little body faces every day as a result of her seizures, GI complications, lack of sleep, and sensory issues? Seven years into our journey with CDKL5 and we are still searching for answers and learning to cope. As we experience and deal with one symptom, another is not far behind. For every new symptom brings the challenge of how to provide relief and maintain comfort. The unknown aspects of Allie's future are difficult to contemplate. Aside from the obvious questions concerning development, will she ever walk or even take one step? Will we ever hear her little voice? Will she ever engage with us? But the most pressing question is, how long will her body endure the torment of CDKL5? Thank you. My name is Marissa Bishop, and I have a sweet, beautiful three-year-old son with CDKL5 deficiency disorder. His name is Gregory, and we live in Connecticut. Like many of the parents here, I remember the day that Gregory had his first seizure. It was the same day that I took his one-month baby photo. I was holding him, sleeping, outside on our deck, when suddenly all four of his limbs were jerking. And by the time I got the pediatrician on the phone, it had ended, and he said to let him know if it happened again, and of course it did. Gregory was diagnosed with epilepsy at two and a half months old, and we learned of his CDKL5 diagnosis at six months. That first year of his life was emotional. Gregory is our only child, so my husband and I were both adjusting to being new parents and navigating what it meant to have a baby with multiple health needs. Our baby had daily seizures. His low muscle tone meant that he struggled significantly with the most basic of gross motor tasks. He couldn't lift his head, he couldn't reach, he was functionally blind, and he needed his bottles to be thickened in order to drink them safely. As he grew, Gregory never officially met any milestones, but he did make progress. Around age one, with the help of his vision teacher, he started peeking, first at red things and then at yellow things. Later on, with physical therapy, when given proper trunk support, he was able to keep his head up in midline for a few minutes on a good day. And around age two, if you set him up just right, he was able to prop sit for a few seconds on his own. Lately, I find myself wondering, despite how challenging those early years were, if they will be Gregory's best years. In 2019, we have struggled. In January, Gregory got sick, a terrible double ear infection and upper respiratory infection that took three rounds of antibiotics to clear. He was so sick that he was unable to suck from his bottle, and he lost and never regained that skill. Because he wasn't able to drink from any cups, suddenly his, feeling, his feeding challenges became a lot more uh, difficult as I struggled to get enough fluids into him by spoon feeding his purees. Then in March, his seizures became completely out of control. He started having tonic seizures that went into clusters of spasms that were so intense and prolonged that he would sleep for hours after each one, and he was averaging nine a day. For weeks, it seems that all he did was seize and sleep. Gregory's alertness was so compromised that he wasn't strong enough to eat by mouth, and over time, he lost that skill too. Right now, Gregory is 100% fed via G-tube. No longer can he prop sit or keep his head up even with trunk support. Right now, he can't even lift his head up off his chest. 
We struggle with how to position him properly so he can engage with our family or work on his vision or other therapies. But currently our biggest struggle is Gregory's respiratory health. We've taken two ambulance rides to the hospital for acute respiratory distress. Gregory's weak cough and his improper swallow contribute to his respiratory issues as he isn't able to successfully clear secretions from his airway. He desaturates daily and needs to be connected to oxygen for varying lengths of time. Gregory sometimes vomits with his seizures, so I rarely risk taking him in the car by myself. From that first cough that indicates he's about to vomit, I really only have seconds to safely pull over and get to him to try and prevent him from aspirating. This year has shown me just how significant Gregory's CDKL5 diagnosis is, and I have no doubt now about its ability to be a life-limiting diagnosis. This past summer, I'd made a bucket list of simple things I wanted to do with him, like have a picnic and go to the beach, but we barely checked anything off. Unfortunately, the desire to get out of the house is usually overshadowed by the stress of actually being out, so we often choose to stay at home. CDKL5 deficiency disorder has made life incredibly challenging for Gregory and for our family, and I worry about him all the time. I'm worried he won't regain the skills that he has lost, worried that even worse seizures are around the corner somehow, and worried that his ongoing respiratory issues will cause irreparable damage to his lungs. And I also feel stressed, stressed because the majority of his caretaking is done by me, stressed that he needs to find private nurses to babysit because grandparents can't do it anymore and our private insurance doesn't cover any nursing, and stressed that Gregory averages 25 seizures a day and about five of them happen overnight so he doesn't get healthy, restorative sleep, and neither do I. My son is strong, but he is fragile, and he is 100% dependent on others to keep him alive. And my hope is that the future will bring advanced treatments that get to the root of his disease, and that this will allow Gregory to learn and to be as healthy as possible so that we can enjoy our life together much more than we are currently able. Thank you. My name is Kathy DeSimone. I'm from Wisconsin, New York, and I'm the mother of my beautiful 10-year-old daughter named Caitlin Amber DeSimone. She's a happy little girl, and she's the light of our lives. I first noticed Caitlin making movements like the moral reflex, but sensed and said something was very wrong. Caitlin's first seizure was when she was five weeks old. She was having up to seven seizures a day. It only lasted a few seconds, but they were quite forceful. Her seizures continued uncontrolled, even with a phenobarbital level of 52 at six weeks of age. At eight weeks of age, we admitted her back to the hospital because she had no quality of life, sleeping 22 out of 24 hours a day. We were finally able to bring her home, but with no diagnosis. I remember placing her completely limp little body in her newly decorated pink nursery. I was shocked to see the difference in tone, and I wondered if it would ever come back. She was finally diagnosed with CDD at about 26 months of age by Boston Children's Hospital in Massachusetts after genetic panel testing. As horrible the diagnosis was, it was an important step forward for her future care, meaningful treatments, and perhaps even a cure. Her seizures continued uncontrolled and brought on other debilitating symptoms. Lack of seizure control is devastating, and it negates any small gains she may have had. We have she would have periods of seizure freedom that could last several months, and, the, and then during those times, Caitlin was sitting independently, transferring an object from one hand to another, and sipping from a straw. She was gaining skills, albeit very slowly. However, at the age of four, and after a month-long hospital stay due to status ellipticus, she lost all those skills. We have found that uncontrolled seizures bring on more debilitating CD symptoms and affect the gain skills. Once the skill is lost, it is very difficult to gain back. Caitlin's extreme hypotonia is brought on by her uncontrolled seizures. but daughter's core is like a wet noodle. She's also showing signs of a curve in her spine, and I fear scol scoliosis may be in her future. Caitlin goes to school every day with a private duty nurse. In addition to monitoring her daily seizures, the nurse positions Caitlin several times a day to protect her spine and pelvis. The nurse is our peace of mind while my husband and I are at work. Caitlin was recently diagnosed with preosteopenia, and she now needs to be followed by a pediatric phys physiatrist and endocrinologist for treatment. 
This would be in addition to being followed by our pediatrician, neurologist, gastroenterologist, orthopedist, and nutritionist. Low tone on the outside also means low tone on the inside. Recently, she's been having problems clearing her secretious, particular in the back of her throat. During a recent coughing incident, she choked on her own phlegm and it blocked her airway. She could not maintain her oxygen level and this resulted in an ER trip, which later turned into an admission when she was not able to breathe room air. Treatments for total seizure control would be life-changing. My daughter is unable to communicate with me. Hand coordination or purposeful use of her hands prevents her from telling me what her needs are. I must guess if her crying stems from pain, hunger, or discomfort. Recently, she cried on and off with tears at school, which is very unlike her because she's always a happy child. The nurse felt she was in pain. When I examined her, I narrowed the pain down to her leg, but she could I could not tell if it was her whole leg, ankle, or knee. X-rays were taken and nothing seemed to be broken. However, it was obvious from her wincing she was still in pain. Three days later, after another X-ray, this time dedicated to her foot, a hairline fracture was found. It's an indescribably sickening feeling that I'm not able to ease my child's pain. Or it's delayed because she can't tell me exactly where she's hurting or how it happened. There is no greater feeling of helplessness when a parent cannot help their child. She needs to be fed, bathed, and dressed by a parent or nurse. She's not toilet trained. And she needs to be carried to and from her bed or bath which is back-breaking work after doing it for 10 years. My husband and I both work full-time, and our care is a taxing second job. But we do what we do for the love of our child. This is what keeps us sane from this disorder, has stolen so much from my daughter and us as a family. To date, this has been a very difficult journey and we must bear down even more. So if her situation worsens, equipment, if her situation worsens, we have become well-versed in all types of durable medical equipment, including wheelchair standards, cough assistant machines, suction machines, nebulizer, we'll be getting a handicap accessibility for her room and bathroom to include a ceiling lift and a walk-in shower. An, accept, an accessible wheelchair van will soon follow. We will need to think of special needs, trusts, and wills for Caitlin's future, so we know that she will always be taken care of, especially we're no longer here. Thank you. My name is Rick Up. My wife, Cynthia, and I live in Spokane, Washington, where we've raised five children. Our fourth child, Olivia, is now 17 years old. Olivia began having seizures when she was two weeks old. By the age of six months, it was already clear she wasn't meeting milestones. She was diagnosed at various times with infantile spasms, atypical Rett syndrome, and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. We did a genetic panel when she was young, but the test didn't include what turned out to be her real disease. It wasn't until on her 11th birthday that she received the correct diagnosis, CDKL5 deficiency disorder. In addition to the ever-present seizures, the primary issues that Olivia suffers from are limited mobility, cognitive and communications impairment, and gastrointestinal problems. GI issues have recently become a big deal for Olivia, and it started with a cough. Until just this year, she would often guzzle down a full cup of water in one go, give a little cough, and then ask for more. This year, we noticed that the little cough was growing into little coughing fits, and they were getting worse. A swallow study revealed that she was aspirating liquids when she drank, and probably had been doing so for some time. Apparently, the only reason she hadn't suffered pneumonia is her insistence on drinking only water. Turns out her simple Epicurean tastes had kept her out of the hospital. But her worsening aspiration meant even water was becoming a danger, not to mention f solid food. 
so she had a G-tube surgically installed this summer. The other GI issue is constipation. This issue is not new. Most of Olivia's life has been a roller coaster swinging between constipation and diarrhea. Olivia has landed in the hospital with acute constipation several times, and anyone who's ever played Oregon Trail knows the dangers of diarrhea. So every day we would walk the fine line and second guess ourselves about the quantity of Miralax to administer. When Olivia was having her G-tube inserted, the doctor suggested also having an appendicostomy so we can administer enema fluid straight to the top of her colon. New procedure, same question. How much do we give her tonight? It seems like with every new treatment, there's a new source of anxiety. Another way that CDKL5 impacts Olivia is by limiting her mobility. Olivia was lucky to be one of the CDKL5 kids who could walk, and she loved it. One of her favorite activities was to go to the mall and walk or even run down the aisles. It was a challenge for us just to keep up with her. Sadly, in recent years, she's become more and more unsure in her steps. Walking is very limited. She falls frequently. And running is nothing more than a memory for us. Can Olivia remember running? Can she remember racing through the mall? Part of me hopes she can't. Still, I think in her dreams, she runs. Olivia's impaired mobility limits more than just trips to the mall. Her bulky stroller, really a type of wheelchair, makes it a challenge to take her into crowded spaces. It was a difficult and sad decision not to take her to our church's Halloween party this year. In past years, we'd just taken her hand and walked her through the displays. This year, we knew she'd be confined to her stroller and the thought of pushing that through the crowd of young children is daunting. Finally, I want to tell you about Olivia's cognition and communications. At 17, Olivia thinks and communicates at the level of a one-year-old. But she can still learn. She loved her special needs class at the junior high school. Then when it was time for her to move up to, at the junior high school rather, then when it was time for her to move up to high school, we went to a meeting where her new special needs teacher explained how the program was focused on things like life skills, learning Washington state history, etc. There was no program in that district for children of more limited skills. My wife left the meeting in tears. We sold our house and moved to a better school district for Olivia. At one time, Olivia had a vocabulary of about 10 or so words. Some of them made up like psh, which means bus, the sound the air brakes makes. Her favorite word was mom. I've only heard her say dad twice. Imagine going 17 years and hearing your child say dad twice. Daddy, not even once. Unfortunately, whether it's the effect of the anti-epilepsy meds on her brain or the effect of the seizures themselves, she's lost the ability to speak almost entirely. One of the words she held on to the longest was Bieberber which the parent of any toddler will tell you means a McDonald's cheeseburger. She would shout out Bieberber and squeal with delight when the car turned into the drive through She was looking forward to that cheeseburger, of course, but I think she was also excited because she felt like this was one area of her life that she could control. In fact, out of control probably describes life with CDKL5 better than anything. What would help us feel more in control? Controlling the seizures, of course, and the GI problems, both the aspiration and the constipation diarrhea roller coaster. But most of all, I wish we could free her brain from the cognitive impacts of CDKL5. There's a sweet, loving, amazing girl just locked in there waiting to get out. I could list a hundred effects CDKL5 has had on our family, but I'll close with this one. Recently, Cynthia and I were talking to our oldest daughter, Emily, about providing guardianship for Olivia once we're gone. She said, don't worry. I've already decided that when I get married, I'm a package deal. Even if that means I don't get married, Olivia stays with me. A young woman in the prime of her life, giving up everything to care for her sister. That's the best and the worst of CDKL5 all in one. Thanks.
this panel has been incredibly brave to sit here in front of you and share their stories and really break the ice. So join me in a round of applause for this panel. Thank you. So now we're gonna open the discussion up to the audience through a series of both polling and discussion questions. Uh, so throughout the rest of our first session here, uh, we're gonna be uh, going to your phones to do some polling questions, and then um, we'll follow up with some discussion. So if we can actually go to our first topic one polling question. So I'm gonna, we're gonna have two back-to-back -back polling questions to get us started, and then I wanna uh, dive in and, and uh, get some input from our audience here. Um, so this first question is, which of the following CDD-related symptoms and health effects does your child currently have? And please here select all that apply. Um, so our options are A, for epilepsy seizures, B, difficulty walking, C, global developmental delay, D, scoliosis or curvature of the spine, E, limited hand control, F, visual impairment, G, limited or absent speech, H, GI and feeding problems, I, respiratory problems, J, behavioral disturbances, K, sleep problems, or L, some other symptom or health effect not listed on this slide that's related to your child's CDD. Uh, the, rest, the percentages that you see displayed are a percentage of the number of responses, not the percentage of individuals uh, that have that particular symptom. So I'll give you a few moments to please select all that apply. So while some final results are trickling in, I think one thing that is apparent from your responses here is the uh, large range of symptoms and health effects that are experienced by so many individuals with CDD. Uh, going down the list, just some of the, the top ones are seizures and epilepsy, difficulty walking, global developmental delay, limited hand control, visual impairment, limited or absent speech, GI and feeding problems. Uh, close behind some of these is respiratory problems, but also behavioral disturbances and sleep problems. Even scoliosis and other symptoms that aren't listed on this slide uh, are rated fairly highly by our group today. Is there a question? So again, the good, there's a question in the audience for those of you on the web about the percentages. Um, uh, so again, this is the percentage of responses. So since everyone could select all that apply, you're seeing a percentage of total responses. The way to really interpret this is to look to see how large the bars are relative to each other. We'll be able to, after the fact, go back and see what percentage of individuals selected each different response. So the fact that we see so many bars that are all to the far right show that there's a high burden of these different symptoms and health effects across many individuals represented here today. Can we go to our second polling question? So these response options will look uh, familiar since they're exactly the same as our prior question. So here, instead of selecting all that apply, we want you to select the top three CDD-related symptoms and health effects that are most bothersome for your child. So here, select the top three of all the symptoms and health effects that your child has that provide the greatest burden to them. And it's the same options as before. And similarly, the percentages are a percentage of responses. OK. 
Okay, I'll give you just a few more moments to get in your responses. As it stands, the symptom and health effect that you all are reporting as being the most burdensome or one of you know, the greatest of a top three burdens is global developmental delay. After that, we have epilepsy and seizures, followed closely by GI and feeding problems. However, no symptom listed here was not selected as a top three most burdensome symptom by some number of you. Um, so that's you know showing that for each individual, uh, the things that might be impacting them most in daily life are different from one another, even with uh, some that may be rising to the top across the group. And so that's gonna be really important for us to explore now, and we can keep these responses up. Um, but I wanna now uh, ask, we have two mic runners in the room, so I wanna um, invite you to raise your hand and if called upon, just state your name. Um, th there's, oh, I know, yeah, thank you. Uh, I was getting the signal in the back. But uh, so we're gonna discuss this topic a bit before we go to our next polling question. Um, so uh, I've just asked you to think about and select the top three CDD related symptoms and health effects that are most burdensome. But now what I wanna do is understand why you made the selections that you made. We heard from our panel some of the things that have been most impacting their children, but I wanna hear from you, um, you know, thinking about the top three things that you just picked, perhaps even thinking about the top number one right. symptom or health effect. Why, is it, why did you say that had the greatest burden on your child? Would someone like to share their top burden? Yes, we'll start right here in the middle and then we'll come right here to you. Hi, I'm Melissa. This is Haley. I'm so we chose um, global developmental delay, yes. um, limited speech, and GI problems. And yes. the reasons behind that, I mean, speech, Haley is very trapped. She's, yes. I think, more cognitively aware than she's able to express. Um, and I think the global developmental delay goes along with that. I think for Haley, seeing other children, her cousins playing and not being able to interact with them mm. is, is probably, it's for us one of the most difficult things and I think for her as well. Um, the reason I didn't pick seizures um, mostly is because well, they're extremely bothersome for us. They aren't for her. Mm. Um, and I think that's very important. She. Seizing is a part of her life. It's like blinking is for us. And I think it's important, see, yes. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that seizures are normal for them. It's the other stuff that's more difficult. Sure, so. yeah, thank you very much. Yep. And that was a, thank you for sharing, you know, the example of, uh, you know, playing with her cousins being kind of the thing that frustrates her. And um, those types of examples are exactly what we'd like to hear today, but yes. Hi, my name is Rita Fredericks, and this is my family, Miles, <laughs> Liam, and Nathan. And as we were picking our top three choices, we um, focus a lot on the fact that Miles does not have a communication system, no way to have expressive or receptive communication. His cortical vision and hearing appearance are greatly impacted by his CDKL5 diagnosis and the dysfunction of his neurologic, neurological system. Um, he's not able to understand or we're not able to con communicate with him what's happening to his body and what he would like to happen to his body or what he would like, what activity, what he would like to stop, what he would like to continue. And that is very difficult for our family. We, um, and all of his caregivers and providers in school and at medical daycare, we'd like to be able to communicate and express to him um, what's going on around him. And um, we'd like to hear what he would like to do. Yeah. Can you give me an example of when that um, disconnect, you know, really is frustrating or, or most yeah. burdensome? Sure. You know, prior to knowing that he was deaf and blind, we were swimming with him and he really enjoyed swimming, but we didn't understand why he didn't enjoy bath time then. And um, he didn't know that he was being plunked into this tub of hot water. And that was alarming to him. And 
you know, we learn now and we have a routine and a system and that helped him. But prior to knowing, you know, we're just moving him from place to place yes. in and out of equipment, um, putting him, just inserting him into activities and whether that's water, sand, um, the floor at home, car seat. And he can't tell us, I, I don't, I don't like this sand. I don't like the way that feels or that water doesn't feel good to me, that's too hot. And so, you know, it's very limited to crying. And of course, it's hard to always know what that means. Yes. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Yes. Who else would like to share uh, some of their thoughts behind what you selected as being most burdensome? Yes. Which one? Deanna? Well, we selected uh, also global developmental delay and visual impairments. And then I shared with my husband, one of us put gastrointestinal and feeding problems, one of us put sleep, because for mm -hmm. us, those two are both very important. But I think the global developmental delay probably takes the primary spot. And for me, not only I would like to know what Lena likes to do, but also what's bothering her. So many, many times when she's crying, I end up asking a list of questions. Is it, does your head hurt? Does your tummy hurt? Are you hungry? Are you sad? What's going on? And sometimes she will stop crying when I reach some mm. option. And I'd like to believe there's a connection and that when I reached the right answer, she stops. But I don't know if she understands. I don't know if she makes that connection. And we do try to address everything that we could possibly think of that could bother her. But I would love to, to know for her to point to her tummy or to you know, smile if I got it right or to show me that she's connected. So if we could somehow unlock the door that keeps her trapped is a good word that I heard here today, um, we would be very, very grateful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Deanna. So others, we have a, we'll take Karen. So I just want to say for Samantha, silence always means yes. So keep, <laughs> keep um, encouraging that tight, because that is communication, right? If you can just stop talking or stop making noise. But I will tell you, the top three were hard for me to pick, but seizures wasn't even in probably the top five. But this is not when I picked, but no one said anything yet, or you briefly mentioned sleep. But um, I've laughed and said, Samantha's conditioned me. I can go like three days with just a few hours of sleep. But I think that is another really big issue, that if we could somehow just figure out a way to help repair the circadian rhythm in these kids to where families could get a decent night's sleep, then you can also face everything else much more fresh and ready for those challenges. Yeah, so, so I'm going to probe then a little bit on okay. the topic of sleep with you. Um, you know, is this, you know, what are the impacts? I mean, I think we have some general idea that lack of sleep is not good, but what specifically is the impact of, you know, three days of you know, not being able to sleep both on, on you and Samantha. So I'll be honest, for Samantha, it almost seems like it doesn't even bother her. <laughs> Sometimes it's like she's the energizer bunny and she's just going. Some nights it's that she's literally just awake and can't sleep. Some nights it's that she's screaming and crying and the same thing, cannot communicate what's wrong. And so you're going through trying to figure it out. For, for me, it's important. Important. If she's awake, I want someone paying attention, right? And then even if you're sleeping, let's be honest. If you have a child like this, and I'm a single parent, so I'm the only one there at night, I don't sleep the same as if someone has taken over her care, then I sleep like a rock. But when she's there and I'm in charge, I'm always sleeping lightly anyway. Mm -hmm. But I'll just give an example. I literally had done three days that I had had no more than five hours sleep in those three days. Mm. The next night, the first time ever, Samantha's 13, the first time ever I slept through a major seizure, mm. a big seizure. And when I woke up, I saw the petechia all over her face and I knew, I was like, oh no. So I picked up my, cause I have a camera that always is videoing. I went through the camera, found it. It was a 10 minute seizure. Wow. And that was the moment I said, okay, never again. If I've missed that much sleep, someone else is in charge for at least one night so I can sleep. But as far as through the day, sometimes I feel like I can't even get out of bed, but I don't have a choice. I have to get out of bed, right? You can't just stay there. Yeah. But you just, you do what you got to do. Sure. 
Thank you so much. Who else would? Yes. Hi. Um, I think for us, it's a combination of visual impairment and hand use, just because it would be, even though we're doing all these therapies, which are, you know, whether it's eye gaze or, you know, visual intervention, or it just, we don't know how much she's processing. We don't know if she's really selecting things because it's just random, mm. or is it because, you know, we're, we're assuming and we're hoping that she's selecting, mommy, I want to read the book, or... Right. So, and that, I think the visual impairment also impacts the hand use majorly. So, you know, they have to be fed, they have to be, you know, provided with things, um, taken care of, and, you know, even, even the use of switches. Mm -hmm. You know, we work so hard on lighting the switch and placing it and the way it's done. And, you know, sometimes, you know, as families, you're just not sure, right. you know, whether it's intentional or not. And, you know, so whatever communication devices you need, you're, you're, you know, there's that visual part that's holding you back. Sure. Um, and eye contact, I think, is a major thing. I just want her to look at me and say, yes, no, just, you know, with her eyes. But even yeah. that, you know, we struggle with a lot. Sure. Thank you. No, thank you. Yes. I just wanted to briefly address the sleep a little more too because Karen is completely right and I can connect with her. Sometimes my husband has to travel for work too and I have Lena overnight every night, obviously. Yes. Um, and after a few nights of a very interrupted sleep, and we're lucky, she sometimes, she's had full nights of sleep before, but lately um, she does sleep two to three hour chunks, which is great, um, but sometimes not. Um, and I realized that the next day, and especially the second day and the third day, I also don't want to go out of, get out of bed, but I have to. Um, but I, I don't do anything that doesn't have to do with her. I change her, I feed her, she's absolutely taken care of. But I forget things sometimes, even things that have to do with her, I do last minute, and that's not my style. Um, I haven't missed a therapy appointment for her yet, but I've missed other things for myself. The house hasn't been cleaned, maybe, timely, or you know, we have to order because we, I don't have time or energy to cook or things like that. I don't feel like doing anything that doesn't have to do with her. And that's very um, distracting. That's very disappointing. That doesn't make me feel great. And I feel like I spend days in a haze sure. where, you know, all I do is just watch her. And is it similar where when she doesn't sleep that it almost is no, you can see no difference in her, or does that have an impact on her as well? Well, I don't know if it has an impact because a lot of times, I mean, she sleeps when she feels like it, and she's up when she feels like it. Sure. So sometimes she'll sleep through the day, but we've had times when she didn't sleep through the night, then she didn't sleep the next day, then she, you know, maybe slept half of the night the next night, and she was again awake. So it doesn't seem like this, the lack of sleep is what's affecting her. Sure. Um, so I, I don't know that I can make a connection there. Okay. Um, but I think overall, neurologically, it is affecting yeah. her because we know the impact that lack of sleep has on the brain. Sure. So whether she recognizes it or we recognize it in her behavior, I know that it's affecting her biologically. Sure. So I wish we could, and we've tried different things to help her sleep, you know, melatonin. I know other parents have tried even harder medications and they don't seem to always have an effect, so. Sure, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. So I see we have a hand here, and then we'll come to the front of the room. My name is Cynthia. Um, Cynthia. I'm going to speak to the topic that is probably the least glamorous that we all deal with every day from the moment we wake up, which is poop. <laughs> so uh, gastrointestinal and feeding problems are probably our daily struggle. And uh, we have been on our journey with Olivia for 17 years. And what we are discovering, uh, and we've known, but we've struggling through if we don't have a healthy gut, which all of our children do not pass um, stool regularly, and constipation is an extreme problem, that does contribute to epilepsy and the amount of seizures she has, and it, it snowballs into a, a horrible storm. So literally, our daily discussion is poop. How was it? Was it enough? Was it, oh, I would, give a million dollars to have a regular movement every day. 
uh, for our daughter. And that, um, that is probably, you know, our, my top three were uh, the speech, as has already been spoken to, uh, to hear, to have a conversation and to help my child in pain, yes. where we can't discover uh, what's wrong with you and I can't help you. You're completely helpless as a parent. And uh, that is probably the most heartbreaking for me. The daily management is the poop and global developmental delay, uh, what we would do to see our child run again and uh, understand. We know that we have a child trapped in that brain. Yeah. And when I can look in her eyes and she can soulfully look to me and I know that she can understand some things and actually mischievously. So yeah. that brings me joy if she does something that... Um, Something simple like hitting something and laughing where she, and if I can tell her, no, that's not nice. And she can smile a little bit. I know she understands me, but she can't communicate that. Sure. And we would like to bring that joy about. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to bring the conversation back to poop. Okay. Um, just to, Happily. so we can understand, um, you know, what this struggle uh, of, uh, looks like a little bit. Is this something, can you maybe describe, is this something that's cyclical? Is it a constant concern of, of uh, being impacted? Or, you know, uh, you know, what's the variability, you know, from day to day? Uh, it's a daily constant. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know if we can't get things moving, and, it, and it's a struggle every day. It's, it's we have to stay on top of it. And her new uh, regime, we, she just had a tube placed in to help with that sure. at 17. And um, when I say daily, I think we all understand it's, it's a daily, um, daily concern. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand right here. Hi. Thank you so much, Miriam. I'm, I'm mother to Landon, age nine, uh, male. And I chose as uh, our most burdensome uh, to echo what a lot of people have said in this room, gastrointestinal and feeding disorders. And I also kind of combine that with the aspiration factor. Mm -hmm. um, I, one of the panelists was talking about um, worrying about overnight vomiting. And to me, that's just something that, you know, pulls away from sleep, but obviously it's just something that is in incredibly stressful in the family. Um, when, you know, when, when my son vomits, um, it is something that raises the stress level in my family just through the roof. Um, you know, my husband and I just can't handle, just can't handle it um, very well. But my son has, from a, a GI perspective, not only does he have a G2 place, but he has ulcers, eosinophilus esophagitis, he has severe GERD, he has uh, slow motility. He's got. Um, he has to have a uh, annual upper GI and lower GI scope, and they take a biopsy of his uh, uh, tissue to check for uh, eosinophilus count. And um, he takes four different medications: Caraphate, Nexium, Pulmacort ingested, um, and he has um, monitoring for. Um, uh, active airway disorder, which is basically asthma of the esophagus. Mm -hmm. So when he does vomit or he has a wet burp, he will um, go into just really bad spasms in the airway, mm -hmm. and it scares him to death. I mean, he can't breathe. He's got mucus that backs up because of it. Um, and we have to get suctioning in place immediately. Um, if this happens at school, they call me from work um, to come try to suction him because he doesn't have the proper, they, they can't provide the proper care for him at school to be able to suction. Um, from a nursing perspective, the nurse suctions him pretty much every hour on this. Um, so when we combine something like being, you know, looking at having to deal with aspiration, and the potential for any of these bacterial um, consequences to end up in his lungs, the vomiting again, back to that, it's, mm -hmm. it really makes, um, makes for a very stressful family situation. And two, two follow-up questions. Um, one is how frequently is he having those vomiting episodes that you were describing? Um, and have you noticed any change over time? Has that been getting worse or has that been about the same for, for you know, pretty stable for some period of time in terms of numbers or severity, severity of the episode? Um, it's, it's some really bad weeks. It's a couple times a week. Okay. Um, 
the GERD, the wet burps that can trigger the vomiting um, may trigger the vomiting or may just end up in GERD and wet burps, but it, it can be as frequent as a couple times a week. Sure. And it has, um, he's been on the ketogenic diet for about, uh, out of nine years of his life, he's been about eight years. So if, if the, the ketosis is too high dialed up, he may vomit as well. So I want to take us real quick to our next polling question, but we'll have some more dialogue after that. Um, so if you can pull your phones back out. Um, so this question, uh, you know, we've been talking about the symptoms and health effects, but here we want to know what are the activities of daily life that are most important that your child is not able to do or do as fully because of CDT, so because of all of those different impacts that we were discussing. So here we'd like for you to select your top three. Your options are A, walking, B, sitting unaided, C, using their hands to manipulate objects, D, feeding oneself, E, independence for most activities of daily living, F, nonverbal communication, G, verbal communication, H, having regular sleep patterns, I, social interaction and participation, J, attending school or having a job depending on their age, or K, some other activity of daily life that would be important to your child that they're not able to do or do as fully due to their CDD. And again, pick the top three activities that you view as most important that your child is not able to do or do as fully. Okay, while well, final results are trickling in, uh, it looks like the activity that uh, is most not able to be done or done fully by our rep individuals represented today is verbal communication, um, followed by nonverbal communication and just general independence for most activities of daily living. However, as a top three most important activity, uh, pretty much all of our other activities listed here um, have been rated and rated highly by many of you. Um, the, the lowest being having regular sleep patterns, attending school or job, and then some other activities that weren't listed. Um, so one of the things that stood out to me from our panel discussion was that there seems to be a period of, albeit difficult, skill acquisition so activities that are able to be done by your children. And then there also then tends to be periods where those skills that have been acquired are lost and sometimes lost permanently. Um, so in thinking about these important activities to you, um, I was wondering if anyone could share their experiences of whether these were um, of activities that are no longer able to be done, but perhaps that were uh, skills or activities that could and were done in the past. So which of these things, to say it another way, uh, were at one point gained, but now lost? Yes, we'll come here and then we'll come to Amanda. Hi, I'm Martha Boyles and our daughter Elsa is almost 14. And when uh, she was about five, she had a um, major increase in, in seizures due to a medication change. And she used to be able to um, hold her sippy cup and use a straw. She was working, even though she has pretty significant cortical visual impairment, she was able to hold a spoon, um, use a brightly colored spoon, bring it to her mouth. We were starting to work on self-feeding. And she lost all of that during that period of intense um, seizure activity f for almost a year. And so she's gained some back. We're just starting to get her to think about holding on to a spoon, has no interest whatsoever in using a straw again or holding on to the sippy cup. So everything has to be given with fluids, either in a um, kind of jello uh, format or um, she will drink water, but we have to use a spouted uh, cup, more like a, a baby cup, but she is um, drinking that. So she has regained quite a bit, but sure. what took about um, a, you know, four weeks of intense seizures to lose has taken us close to eight years to regain even wow. close to it. Wow, thank you. Let me just bring that over to Amanda. 
So I'm going to speak to um, the social interaction and participation, and I'm also going to say the behavior slide before um, very much relates for our family. Um, when Ava was younger, it was a lot easier to get her out into the, to the community. Um, she was smaller, she was quieter, people were more tolerant of some of the behaviors that Ava um, has developed over the years. Um, I think about every one of those behavior aspects I could attribute to her, mm -hmm. and um, you know, society just isn't real accepting of our children, so I think that's an additional burden that is very hard for us to you know talk about or or that probably gets overlooked in the conversation um i'll give you an example we go to a mexican restaurant ava loves um ava loves enchiladas <laughs> and this is uh, a restaurant very close to our home and they love ava um probably two times i have overheard people complaining to management about uh, ava being loud um, and management has kind of said deal with it or go, but I do know that, you know, people aren't always uh, as accepting of, of, you know, some of the teeth grinding, but, you know, there's, there's many different um, behaviors that can be very distracting, especially in public. Yeah, so has that, um, that kind of, uh, I guess, a negative feedback loop has that resulted in fewer social outings? It, it does. It's hard to deal with. I mean, I even at my own North campus of my local hospital have had <laughs> go-arounds with nurses. She'll bang her head on walls and do things that I just, if I'm the only caretaker in there, I'm not always in control of some of the things she's doing if I'm helping do something else. So, you know, even in a medical institution, sometimes they're not quite aware or capable of, of handling <laughs> these types of children and their behavior. So I think it's a very, um, I think it's a, a very big chunk of what keeps some of us at home, especially as our kids age. Sure. Thank you so much. We have a hand right back here. Hi, my name's Carol Ann. I'm from England, and I'm mum to this little bundle of joy <laughs> who uh, is very loud and happy today. So Amber's not really regressed in, in at all, really. Okay. But one thing that we do struggle with is, is just to hop back to sleep. When she was little, she used to go through phases where she wouldn't sleep for days, or it seemed like days on end. Um, and then things really, really improved. But just lately, probably within the last six months, she can go for um, at least four nights a week where she's having an all-night party. Um, and it's not just an all-night party. It's an all-night and the following day before she then crashes. We'll catch up or rebound for 24 hours, and then we'll go on another 36-hour jolly trip of her own and I think that that's one of the things as she's got older so she's 14 now um, she's not started uh, her periods yet and I think that that's probably one of the reasons why sleep is a little bit more impacted as she's moved into puberty okay. the other thing is is she started a single use compassionate trial of, uh, at Lauren earlier this year so wow. we're into about four or five months of starting that drug and I think since it kind of coincided with that so I'm not sure if it's a side effect of the drug that actually her overall mood has improved and because her overall mood has improved she's just wired quite a lot of the time um, or whether it is because she's you know just about to enter those womanhood years. Mm -hmm. The other side effect, obviously, of sleep, and I was going to um, talk in the previous session, is is that I actually t uh, ticked the behavioural difficulties. So a lot of the sleep problems that we have are related to hyperactivity. So she can't switch off, and, and we kind of know at five o'clock in the afternoon if she's kicking her legs and thrashing around and laughing like somebody's told her a really unfunny joke <laughs> that, you know, we're in for a, a rough night. And when you work full-time, that is a major issue. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to share that, really. No, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more comment before we take a break. Yes? Yes, thank you. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Karen Diller and our daughter is Carly. Carly is 23 years old. Uh, we did not get a diagnosis until she was 14. But the one thing that um, she loved to do was attend school. I think one of the saddest moments was to see her graduate. Mostly because I knew that we were going to be her life. She no longer had friends. No one, no one to that was similar to her. Um, we are lucky enough to have nursing care um, for a few hours every day, uh, except weekends. But we have one nurse who will take her to Walmart or someplace, and so she does get to have some socialization. However, what happens when she has gone to the bathroom in her diaper? Well, when you have a little one, it's not too hard to change them in the bathroom. But when you have someone who's 23 years old, 80 pounds, even though she's not a big girl, where do you change her pants? Those are some of the most difficult things for us right now. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, uh, at this point, we're going to take a, a quick stand and stretch break. Um, if you need to use the restrooms, they're out. Uh, these doors to the right. We are going to start back up right at 3.35 to uh, jump into our second topic of talking about uh, treatment approaches. So thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, from our short little break. Um, thank you so, so much for that, uh, all of that input on our first session on symptoms and daily impacts of living with CDD. Um, we're going to have plenty of time for more discussion to really build on that uh, earlier discussion, but in the context of looking at what are the current treatment approaches um, that we have, um, treatment approaches being broadly defined not only as uh, pharmaceutical drugs or, or prescription drugs, 
um, but also other things that you might utilize, whether that be things over the counter, medical procedures, medical devices, uh, diet, exercise perhaps, uh, or even lifestyle modifications. So anything that you might use to try to help treat or manage and live with CDD. And we're gonna, uh, in this session, explore how well those things are working, as well as what the downsides are of currently available treatments. And then we're gonna end by looking towards the future and getting your thoughts and preferences around what you would be looking for from that next future treatment. So to get us started on this topic, we have another panel for you. We have Kristen, Martha, Rita, Amanda, and Ed, who are gonna be sharing their and their children's and grandchildren's stories. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask Kristen to kick us off. Thank you. My name is Kristen. I live in a suburb of Philadelphia with my husband, Brian, and our three daughters. Our youngest daughter, Avery, who is five, has CDKL5. Avery was diagnosed when she was just five, four months old. At the time, they had just added CDKL5 to the infant epilepsy panel, and Avery was one of the youngest patients diagnosed. Since her diagnosis, Avery has tried and failed four different anti-epileptic drugs. She is currently taking Onfi and Depakote, as well as taking part in the Ganoxalone clinical trial. She's also on the very strict ketogenic diet. Her diet is 90% fat, 7% protein, and only 3% carbohydrates. So no Halloween candy this weekend for our little girl. Avery takes five supplements, a multivitamin, calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, and selenium, as well as a daily probiotic to compensate for the vitamins and minerals missing in her diet. Avery had surgery in 2018 to place a G-tube after losing her safe swallow during an episode of status ellipticus. Since then, she has struggled with many of the GI symptoms all too common in children with CDD. To combat excessive reflux and vomiting, she takes ranitidine and omeprazole. She also takes a low dose of erythromycin to help her with gastric motility. Each of these drugs have their own dosing guidelines. Some need to be taken before food, some need to be taken with a meal, some are taken three times a day, while others are taken twice a day. All in all, we give Avery a dose of medication at six different times throughout the day, which interrupts her normal learning and play. Additionally, each of her meals is considered a dose of medication. For the ketogenic diet, we need to weigh everything to the tenth of a gram and ensure that she eats it in its entirety within 30 minutes. Even with all of this, Avery still has four to six big seizures a day. She still suffers with GI issues. We still find ourselves cleaning up vomit and having to give her suppositories to induce a bowel movement. Some of the drugs we have tried have worked for a while, and then their efficacy has dwindled slowly. For example, she was on Topamax for years. We saw a stunning improvement in seizure control when she first started the drug as an infant. So we put up, put up with the major side effects of appetite suppression, heat intolerance, and acidosis. But slowly, over the course of two years, the seizures crept back in, getting longer and more intense until she ended up hospitalized. Some of the drugs we've tried made it clear very quickly that they were not the drug for Avery. In the case of Keppra, the medication made her seizures skyrocket to over 100 a day. The ketogenic diet is a particularly difficult treatment to evaluate efficacy because it can take a very long time to work. When we first started it, we noticed some seizure reduction, but the real reason we are still on it is that we immediately noticed some increased cognitive ability. She made better eye contact and was able to focus on tasks for longer. We are still in the diet because, frankly, we are afraid to remove it and risk losing this side effect. We are a very active family and we love to travel. Avery has traveled the world with us. In order to facilitate this, we must plan and prepare. To travel, we pack her pump, her formula, her scale, and her blender. We pack her medications, her syringes, her pulse ox machine. We pack her diapers, her rescue medication, her speech generating device. You should see us try to get through the TSA checkpoints at the airport. <laughs> this is our life with CDD. Is it hard? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. What would I like to look for in an ideal treatment for my daughter? The answer to this question has evolved so much since her initial diagnosis. Five years ago, I would have said seizure control. Do whatever it takes to make these awful, heartbreaking seizures go away. Now, my number one focus would be increased cognition. 
I truly believe that Avery is in there, that she is stuck inside this little body that will not cooperate. There was one of those things circulating on social media a year or so ago, posing the question, if you could have a conversation with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Everybody else is answering with lost loved ones, influential people, or historical figures. You know, my grandmother, Bill Gates, the Dalai Lama, things like that. But the only answer that I could think of was my daughter. She's sitting right here beside me, but she cannot tell me what is on her mind. I would give just about anything to sit and have a conversation with my girl, to know her, to really know her. What is her favorite color? Who is her favorite princess? What would she like to be when she grows up? So while I, of course, would love better seizure control and something to help her GI symptoms, a treatment that would allow her to interact with us, to joke around with her sisters, or tell her daddy that she loves him, would be worth its weight in gold. Thank you. Hello, I'm Martha Boyles from Lexington, Kentucky, mom to our sweet, almost 14-year-old daughter, Elsa. Like all first-time parents, when she arrived, we were ecstatic that she had all 10 fingers and toes. But within about six weeks, strong startle episodes, which eventually proved to be infantile spasm seizures, came into play. She was not visually tracking objects and was light gazing. Elsa is on the more moderate to severe side of the CDD spectrum in some aspects, but has blessedly been spared other challenges of the disorder. For Elsa, decreased gastrointestinal motility has manifested mostly as constipation and severe abdominal cramping. When she was five to seven years old, any significant degree of constipation was clearly linked to an increase in her seizure activity. Over the years, to help with the constipation, we've had to continually adjust the approach. High fiber foods, adding fiber supplements, probiotics, magnesium citrate, and her body seemed to acclimate to each change, and she required more to maintain some degree of regularity. It was not until she was prescribed Senna at the age of seven that we saw a more consistent resolution to her constipation. She seems to need that particular stimulation from Senna that her own GI system is lacking. In the past three years, as she nears puberty, Elsa's seizures have evolved into a cycle with two weeks of intense seizure activity followed by a 30-day break. During the two weeks of seizure activity, Elsa is fairly lethargic and has severe bowel cramping on a daily basis. Even a 30% increase in GI motility would help her to recover more quickly and minimize those severe cramps. Although Elsa has been on nine different anti-epileptic drugs in different combinations, one of the main interventions that has improved her seizure control the most has been the modified Atkins diet. The modified Atkins diet has improved her seizures by 60 to 70%, although it took close to a year to see the full benefit. The only time that she was not on the diet was when Vigabatrin was weaned and Vimpat was added as her main medication. This change led to uncontrolled daily seizure activity and an almost complete loss of her ability to swallow. Although we had quickly gone back to Vigabatrin, she only regained good seizure control, one seizure every four to five days, once she was fully back on the modified Atkins diet. With that diet's reduction in seizures, Elsa is actually able to make progress in her physical therapy goals and enjoy more outside activities as a family. Decreased bone strength has been a persistent issue for Elsa since she had a hip surgery in 2015 for a progressing subluxation of her right hip. She went from standing well with very minimal assistance at the hip for 30 plus minutes to only wanting to stand for a few minutes at a time. Unfortunately, the stiffness of her bones and the stiffness of the plates were not good matches during the strong tonic muscular contractions at the start of her seizures. She has suffered four complete fractures of her right femur around the plates. We use a knee immobilizer during the intense seizure cycle to help limit the degree of contraction of her hamstrings. And although the immobilizer has helped, it limits her ability to move freely on her play mat, adjust positions in her sleep, and sit or stand comfortably. Although Elsa gets the plates removed as soon as possible, future therapies focusing on improving bone strength 
would give her an increased ability to stand and walk with assistance. With Elsa's visual processing challenges, we sought out a cortical visual impairment specialist to help us with the best strategies to present visual information to Elsa as a baby. She had us initially present one object at a time in red hues that Elsa would visually attend to against a dark background. She can now handle more visual complexity and also uses a head switch with a recorded me message to select her preference when verbally given choices by a partner. Until she could use the head switch in this manner, we had no idea that Elsa's favorite color was actually purple. Her CVI brain would tell her to notice the bright colors, and she would look at those quite quickly with her eyes. But when given verbal color choices, Elsa always chooses purple. We would love to see more research and therapy directed at visual processing and the ability to identify what she may actually be seeing. Is it double? Is it fragmented? Is it inverted? In a nonverbal child with moderate CVI, understanding how Elsa sees is critical to us if she is to make any real progress in her ability to make associations and to learn. Even a 20 to 30% improvement in her functional vision could allow her to make those connections and engage more in the world around her. For Elsa, the inroads into addressing gastrointestinal motility and cortical visual impairment would benefit her the most on a daily basis. We have a long way to go to formulate the best treatments for children with CDD to alleviate pain and give them the chance to experience and enjoy more of life. Elsa loves to cuddle, and at the end of a long work day, she gives us all much more joy than she knows. Thank you. My name is Rita Fredericks and I am mom to nine-year-old Liam and four-year-old Miles Fredericks. We are from Grimes, Iowa, a suburb of Des Moines. Miles was diagnosed with CDKL5 at the age of four months in September of 2015. The first symptoms we noticed were seizures, unusual eye movement, no looking at or interacting with familiar faces, no response to sound, voices, or music, and difficulty nursing. These dual impairments, physical delays, and intractable epilepsy continue to impact Miles today. Currently, Miles is on the ketogenic diet, a nutrition-based diet supplemented with macronutrients used to assist in seizure control. He takes two AEDs and additional multiple medications to counteract the effects of his diet and the AED by keeping his organs and body functioning, medications to manage his respiratory airway disease, and controlled home suction to keep his airway open. Additionally, he has multidisciplinary therapy sessions, physical, occupational, speech therapy, and reflex integration. Over time, Miles has tried six different combinations of AEDs. Some were used with the ketogenic diet as well. He started on seizure medications when he was nine weeks old, and he started on the ketogenic diet when he was five months old. Mild seizures have increased in types over time. Currently, the intensity of the physical movements and the rigidity of his body and the length of seizures from two minutes to now clusters of seizures lasting about 45 seconds have decreased with treatment. But the frequency has only slightly decreased by two to four per day. Our son's cognitive impairment, vision and hearing impairment, Feeding delays, GI, nonverbal status, and physical impairments have remained severely delayed with very little development or progress, even with multiple weekly therapy appointments and therapy intensives and with his diet and medication treatments. Additionally, Miles was recently diagnosed with brittle bones due to his CDKL5, low tone, and treatment side effects. His bones are like straws, hollow inside. We aren't able to access treatments yet as we need him to break a bone first for insurance approval. There is a variance in his symptoms based on seizure activity. During times of increased seizures, he has a harder time participating in therapies, school and social, home life. For instance, we're a family that loves to ride bikes and we recently were able to get an adapted bike that Miles can join us with. 
but he's unable to keep his little physical strength to sit in the seat properly without cutting his airway off during times of increased seizure activity. This is an activity he loves and connects with. The movement and the breeze on his body and in his face speaks to his sensory and vestibular needs. Fatigue and circadian rhythm dysfunction leaves him unable to stay engaged with activities that would help strengthen and maintain his skills and abilities. He loses stamina and he becomes very agitated and often gets sick with respiratory or GI illness. With these types of setbacks, he is constantly running a marathon. This leads to very slow, minimal progress. The most significant downside to Miles' treatments are the lack of flexibility in his schedule due to his therapy, medication, and feeding, and the hard to explain impact on our family life together and on the physical and mental health of our family overall. His AEDs impact his brain development, personality, kidney and liver function. His diet impacts his ability to gain weight and grow at a typical pace and impacts his kidney, liver, and GI function. Both result in him needing to take additional medications. Miles sees 17 specialists at two children's hospitals in two different states. This ensures his care and treatment is being managed and we're able to discuss any concerns or needs. The cost to our time, our car, our family are hard to put into words. We all have been in some type of counseling now to work on how we manage the stress and emotional impacts of raising and caring for a child with severe disabilities such as Miles and those impacts on his sibling Liam as well. With the dual sensory impairment, it is difficult for Miles to get on a schedule with his wake and sleep times. This is a known symptom of CDKL5 and tends to get worse with age and leads to children being awake for days on end. Our home has become a live-in therapy and care facility. It's not a typical home because of Miles' needs. Miles has a soft play area where he's able to explore and interact with switch toys in the hopes that he will learn cause and effect. He has a hammock style swing that hangs from a ceiling in our dining room. This helps him receive his vestibular input that he needs often. He has a little room to help teach him spatial recognition and to help him understand that there's a world around him. Ideal treatment would see better seizure control for Miles. Fewer seizures would lead to less damaging side effects on the developing brain and increased neurological function and neuron development and transmission and brain processing abilities. Improvements in hypotonia, physical skill development, improved language acquisition, sleep patterns, and organ body function are priority concerns. Mild symptoms are managed in a way we tolerate but are not improved and are not controlled to the best level we would like or to a level that allows Miles to progress in a way that is meaningful to him. Help us make this adventure meaningful for Miles and for our CD Cal Five family. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Jackshaw, and I am here today from Loveland, Colorado, as a mom to Ava and Eliza. In 2012, around the age of six and a half, Ava received a molecular diagnosis of CDKL5 deficiency disorder. Her diagnostic journey began when she was around seven months old after having her first motor seizure and some vision concerns. Ava endured thousands of seizures and failed most available anti-epileptic drugs or AEDs by the time we identified the small deletion causing a reading frame shift on her CDKL5 gene. She is now 14 years old and attends a public education school with a focus on augmentative and alternative communication, or AAC. Currently, Ava's maintenance AEDs include divalproic sodium, clobazam, diazepam, and an investigational drug. AEDs have historically provided Ava relief for only short periods if they work at all. We have tried phenobarbital, topramate, oxcarbazepine, zinosamide, rufinamide, gabapentin, and rescue medications including clonazepam, diastat, and midazolam. Sometimes AEDs make things worse for Ava. Over the years, she has experienced serious and life-threatening side effects from drugs used to treat epilepsy. Before her CDD diagnosis, around age four, 
she acquired electrical status epilepticus during sleep caused by oxcarbazepine. It led to the addition of high-dose diazepam at night that continues today. At age 10, she narrowly escaped liver failure from a severe drug hypersensitivity reaction known as drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, or DRESS syndrome, shortly after we introduced a second-generation AED adjunct therapy of rufinamide. DRESS syndrome is rare and not well understood. There are no treatment options other than withdrawal of suspect drug and high-dose steroids. It took a four-month treatment course of prednisone to bring her liver back to baseline from near failure. A few months later, she contracted mycoplasma pneumonia that triggered a 20-day hospital stay, including 14 days in the PQ. 10 of those days were spent intubated. It was the first and last time to date she has experienced a respiratory illness requiring hospitalization. As Ava neared the onset of puberty, we again lost functional seizure control. We prioritized her abrupt need for a spinal fusion over a vagus nerve stimulator placement, leaving us with few opportunities to address this decrease in her quality of life. Fortunately, we learned of trial options on the horizon, and despite weeks of documented seizure observation and a diagnosis synonymous with refractory epilepsy, we still had to provide an additional six weeks of observation data to join a study. Ava had an additional 115 motor seizures while we collected that data. Once she began the experimental drug, she experienced an immediate increase in seizures, and a few days later, a gradual reduction from baseline activity emerged. To our surprise and delight, her anxiety and ear-piercing vocalizations decre decreased substantially within the first six weeks. Her gross motor skills also became more fluid and sustained, as noted by her physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor around three months after reaching the maintenance dose. For the first time in her life, we attended medical appointments without her wheelchair as she was able to stand and ambulate for longer distances without a need to rest. Expressing her voice more proficiently with her eye gaze communication device has also improved. Using your eyes to communicate takes an incredible amount of muscle control and motor sequence planning, as well as highly specialized speech and language therapists. In the past four years, she has gone from using four large symbol button buttons via hand selection to using eye gaze onto eight to 12, up to 24, and currently demonstrating she can handle 45 buttons to communicate. Her desire to share what she is thinking is strong, and the impact, and the impact of gaining this skill is undervalued. One of the most unbearable aspects of CDD is knowing that your child is desperately trying to tell you something but not truly being capable of hearing what it is they are trying to say. Communication is a fundamental human right, and the barriers of access to these systems are steep for intellectually disabled people. Identifying specialists with the skills to appropriately assess, fund, and implement AAC systems is a tall order. Communication beyond yes, no, and request is possible and life-changing for both patients and caretakers. Today, Ava can greet her peers, say I love you, tell us to go away, that she feels diabolical, hangry, sick, or content. We remain in the extension study for the investigational drug, and her baseline seizure count has decreased markedly. While her epilepsy remains, remains refractory, the other changes I spoke of have improved our quality of life beyond anything imagined. I have hope for a day when Ava can use one or maybe two drugs for seizure control that don't make her agitated, constipated, floppy, or sleepy, to help her better communicate, to improve her ability to self-feed, toilet, and dress with minimal support, to reduce the burden of severe anxiety and behaviors such as loud and constant vocalizations, self-stimulating, and self-abuse are life-changing improvements. Developing drugs that foc focus on global brain outcomes beyond seizure reduction is an urgent and unmet need in the CDD community. I'd like to thank you for giving me the time to share my story today. My name is Haley Hilt. I am a 12-year-old CDD girl. My grandfather is reading this for me. He has helped mommy and daddy care for me since birth. I am here today with my mom, Melissa. We hail from Skodak, New York, which is a stone's throw from Albany, New York. Everyone here should already know some basic things about CDCAL5's major impacts. But what you may not know 
is that I am normal in some very important ways. My receptive communication is clearly intact. When I choose to and when I can, I think quite clearly and speak quite clearly with my eye gaze computer. However, I am constantly impeded by my disabilities, not the least of which is my intractable epilepsy, motor impairments, and my cumbersome eye gaze talker. My current treatments include two epilepsy medications, as well as PT, OT, and speech, music therapy, all of which are provided by a great school program. These therapists, or excuse me, these therapies are challenges I welcome, but they are limited in their effect. Yet I hope one day I can overcome my limitations, but the odds are against me without help from this community. I hope that is not news to you. My future lies in the outcomes of focused research, exhaustive review of related research, and a vigorous battle against the often secretive and proprietary words, ways of basic science research. Let us deal with my epilepsy first. Not a day goes by wherein this is not an issue. To overcome, we have tried approximately 16 anti-epileptic drugs. Think about that. 12 years, 16 meds, each of which requires a titration period, all with varying side effects. Some side effects require the meds be stopped. Others require an adjustment period to get through transitory side effects, or in the alternate, a weaning off period and subsequent search for a new drug to begin the cycle again. And as I grow, seizures wax and wane in both kind and severity. It has been a lifetime of titration and side effects. And let's not lose sight of well-intentioned MDs possessed with sol solving each and every seizure problem if that, as if that was my only problem. The process is sheer lunacy for those with intractable seizures. Surely you can find a better way. On to my talker, which is my official eye gaze computer. It is cumbersome and tiresome to use because of the calibration issues. I'll refer you to a recent scientific article that states, classic calibration methods taking time and imposing on natural behavior on the eyes must be replaced by intelligent methods that are able to calibrate the signal without conscious cooperation by the user. Our time to speak is limited today, so let me take, make the most out of it. I want you to look into my eyes and those of my sisters and brothers as we sit here today. They are often clear and bright. I see you, hear you. I want you to know that we are trapped. My mother, father, grandfather, teachers, and therapists will tell you I am capable of clear, deliberate, intuitive thinking, and occasionally biting humor. My first physical therapist has shared with me that my motor planning is intact and perfectly normal. You see it now, don't you? It is my transmission that is broken. At the clinical level, I often feel that I'm seen as just a seizure nuisance. Read your own research. Nothing in it says I was born broken. I am, as you call it, delayed. It seems to say that when I needed my CDKL5 the most, it failed me. The seeds of my future are here. They need to be watered. My neuronal system needs to be rescued and restored, and I will do the rest. In a sentence, I want to walk and talk without the fog of drugs. With greater strength in my vocal cords and limbs, I may learn to talk and walk and grow, just like any other child does. Children learn in play putting one neuron, synapse, and foot in front of the other. And let me not forget to remind you that increased strength and muscle tone will go a long way towards easing the cardio, respiratory, and gastro problems plaguing my brothers and sisters. Not to worry about benchmarks. Nothing is more measurable than movement, a spoken word, fewer medical issues, and lower bills. And I want you to keep in mind that CDD children are not unusual when it comes to seizures and motor issues. And the gene CDKL5 seems to be crucial across multiple domains, which gives me hope that there is light at the end of my tunnel. However, I must be cautious in my expectations. I am as unique as you are. 
Your genetic profile, including your deletions, your insertions, your copy variants, make me and you one of a kind. Unfortunately, we're not like cars, we're in the model number dictates the parts we need. So, to all of your stakeholders, you tell me, where do I place my expectations? Do I choose the road of endosymptomatic treatments, like my current drug regimen, or a restart of my dormant CDKL5 gene, or a repair of my active CDKL5 gene? Finally, please see us for our potentials, not our symptoms and limitations. Isn't that what we all want? Another truly incredible panel, set of panelists, join me in thanking them all for the, sharing their stories. So uh, now we move into our second opportunity to uh, extend the conversation with all of you uh, here in the room and with our polling questions for those of you who have been following along on the web. Um, I'd like to start with uh, two polling questions that we have to get uh, an idea of the range of experiences we have in the room uh, with different treatment approaches. So if we can pull up our first topic to polling question, please. So here we want to uh, know what medications or treatments your child is currently using. And here, please select all that apply. So your options are A, anti-epileptic drugs, B, steroid treatment, C, experimental medications such as uh, drugs in clinical trials or expanded access, D, formulations of medical cannabis, which includes CBD, E, vagus nerve stimulator, F, sleep medication, G, neurosurgery, H, the ketogenic diet, I, supplements, or J, other medications or treatments. And note our next question will cover uh, non-medication uh, treatment options like therapies, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, and medical devices. So please select all that your child is currently using. And again, the, uh, as with our earlier set of polling questions, the percentages displayed are a percentage of responses, not the percentage of people who have selected an individual response. Yes. What's the, so this is to treat uh, C, the, your child's CDD, any aspects of the CDD, yes. And other can include other pharmaceutical products not listed, for example, symptomatic treatments. Great question. Give you a few more moments to log the different types of medications and treatments that your child is currently using to treat or manage their CDD. While final responses are trickling in, it looks like the greatest experience uh, current, of currently used treatments are anti-epileptic epileptic drugs, uh, followed by um, supplements. However, there is experience uh, in the room with uh, sleep medication, ketogenic diet, uh, as well as with investigational therapies as part of either clinical trials or expanded access, different formulations of medical cannabis, which includes CBD, and VNS. We have some experience with steroid treatment. No one listed neurosurgery, surgery, and we have people who have listed other uh, medications or treatments, which we'll certainly want to hear about as part of the audience discussion. Can we go to our second polling question? So broadening the range of things that we would consider a treatment or approach to managing um, your child's CDD, uh, we want to know uh, the full range of things that you um, are, are doing to try to manage the symptoms. So this includes A, physical therapy, B, occupational therapy, C, speech therapy, D, hippotherapy, E, hydrotherapy, F, 
orthotics support, G, modifications or other accommodations in the house, H, eye gaze speech production devices, I, mobility equipment, J, nutritional support, K, approved pharmacologic therapies, um, L, investigational products or experimental products like those used in clinical trials, and M, some other way that you try to treat or manage your child's CDD symptoms. That's not listed on this slide. Please select all that apply. Give you just a few more moments to log all of the different approaches to managing and treating your children's CDD symptoms. All right. So as it stands, it looks like there's a few treatment options that there's the most experience with um, of those represented today. Uh, we have approved pharmacological uh, therapies, which does include the uh, anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, we also have a lot of experience with physical therapy and occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, a great deal of uh, use of mobility equipment, orthotic support, and other modifications around the house. Um, and then experience with all of the other different approaches to treatment and management listed on this slide, including many others that aren't listed on the slide. So um, we'll, we'll keep these responses up there um, to keep you thinking about the full range of different uh, approaches to treatment that we might want to talk about. Um, and now give you another opportunity to raise your hand to participate. I will remind you, please uh, wait to have a microphone to speak and uh, state your name before you uh, provide your, your response. So every treatment approach um, has benefits, has risks or downsides, um, has goods, good things, bad things associated with it. I wanna start with a question focused first on what has been, what are the good things? What has been working well or at least working best? And so of the different treatment approaches that we've just asked you about, um, what would you say are, the, uh, for your child, the thing that has helped them most um, deal with their symptoms, treat their symptoms, or even just manage their symptoms in, in daily life? And if you could uh, explain um, how it is really that you've noticed that particular treatment approach uh, improving their life uh, or helping them manage their symptoms, uh, we'd love to hear that. So who would like to share a treatment approach that has worked well or, or at least best of what you have available. Yes. I'm Carol Ann from England again. So Amber was diagnosed just before her fourth birthday and um, at that point she had been on 21 therapies for seizures at, just before her fourth birthday. When she was diagnosed, we knew that obviously intractable epilepsy was the main symptom and that we were probably never going to get control. So when she was four, she went on Vigabitrin. Um, she went on a dose of 1,500 milligrams a day. She's only recently gone up to uh, 2,000 milligrams a day, so at one sachet. For her, that was her miracle. Um, a year later, she then had the vagus nerve stimulator placed and she's now on her third. Probably, I would say, within two years of the VNS being placed, she no longer had tonic spasms. So her seizure type is a non-motor. So in so sort of nine years, she's been tonic-free. Mm. Other than we know that when the battery starts running out on a VNS, she starts to have... Um, sort of stiffenings that start creeping back. So for her, that's been her magic combination. Um, yeah, but 22 therapies at four, it's not good enough really, not yeah, good enough how, at all. How long did it take for her to be able to kind of get to that, I think what you called it, you know, miracle place? Um, so when she started Vigabitrin, she didn't, um, it, was, it was almost like the, um, 
convulsive element had been removed and she was left with this long, complex, partial type presentation. Mm -hmm. So she would be sort of really flat, clearly not with it. Um, but it, it was about a month after we started Vigabatrin that actually we, we put it all in one dose. So she had probably for about eight years, her Vigabatrin dose was in the morning. And that was when the tonic spasms kind of stopped. But in terms of what we have now, it was probably two years with Vigabatrin and the vagus nerve stimulator. Yes. And yeah. now she's on Translana or at, uh, at Loren, and the morning seizures that she used to have were on wakening, which would be sure. the absences, the quite long absences, and they would be up to 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. She no longer has them. Mm -hmm. So she might have the odd absence throughout the day, but certainly significantly improved on this compassionate trial of um, the nonsense mutation drug and uh, Vigabatrin, and she's now on a small amount of Keppra <coughs> as well. So for us, we found that low-dose drugs not going... not drugging her up to the point yeah. where she can't learn and she's sleeping all the time, okay. and the VNS has been her magic. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. What else has worked well or... Uh, hello, it's Robert and Kate Gorelick from Westfield, New Jersey. It's our daughter, Lauren, and, um, you know, in some way or form or another, we've tried almost every single one of these therapies uh, without the horse. We've got to make sure we pick up a horse on the way home. But um, <laughs> the, without a doubt, the, the G-tube is the one that we probably fought the longest, and in hindsight was, uh, you know, we, I don't know why, looking back, we waited so long. Uh, Lauren's seizures are a little unique, and I don't know if this is... Other families in the room have seen this, but her seizures come in clusters. Uh, we will go three, four weeks without really seeing any seizures whatsoever, and then we call it her bad week, and usually it's connected to her uh, female cycle, and she has two, three, four, or five days of just where she's not eating, she's not drinking, uh, she's just having clusters of seizures. So the G-tube you know, allowed us to get food and fluids and medicine in her when uh, she's having those bad periods. and. Um, you know, that certainly has been probably the biggest improvement in our caretaking and in, in her life. It's something we look back on and it's always hard to schedule a surgery, you know, put that on the calendar for your daughter. But in hindsight, that's the absolute best thing we did um, for her is to, you know, get a tube in her. Yeah. And how long has she been on the G-tube? 2015. Uh, 2015. 2015. Yeah. Great. Thank you. A hand here, then we'll come to the front. Hi, um, I wanted to talk about the hypnotherapy. Um, our daughter's 23 years old. She does not bear weight. She does not sit up alone. Um, she, but when we put her on a horse, she would droop forward. When the horse, as soon as it started to walk, she sat straight up. It was wonderful. We did this for uh, several years. However, Carly, uh, started, she had a growth spurt, scoliosis, she has a chronically dislocated left hip because she can't speak to me. I know, and she's tight when I put her on the horse. So I don't know if it hurts. So I don't do it anymore. Um, but I highly recommend that therapy. Um, I'd also like to say that Epidiolex has been our drug. Um, she was on maybe 12 or 14 different drugs over her lifetime, plus the ketogenic diet. Um, well, we were in the trial at Langone University, and um, while she was in that trial, we had to stay on one other seizure drug. She was in that trial for four and a half years. We were going there. Um, we have since taken her off the other seizure drug. She is only on Epidiolex. It has cut her seizures over 60% and continues to do so. So I'm very thankful for that. And what, what has that 60% um, reduction meant for her? Oh, oh it had, gives her days. She actually has sometimes a week without a seizure. She smiles. She is clearly 
happier. Even though she can't speak to me, she is clearly happier. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. So really Dan, if we can. Yep. Uh, <laughs> All right, we'll take a, a, a quick comment here. Hi. Yes. I'm Kristen, and Hi, Kristen. Um, Avery's mom. And I just want to say Epidiolex. Avery was um, been on Epidiolex trial for almost over five years. So um, we too were able to come off the other drugs. But um, one of the drugs that Avery's been on for nine years is clorazepate for sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and she sleeps beautifully. So I just wanted to, um, she sleeps about 11, 12 hours a night. So, and I get sleep every night as a result of it. So I just want to kind of put it out there for the docs in here. Um, I know he's over there, Dr. Davinsky, but um, she's been on this. Obviously, the dose has gone up over the years, but she's been on it since she was two, and she's 11. And what has the, you know, um, I guess, predictable... And, and she goes to school sleep. every day, gets up and functions and... So when um, she started, when you started that and she was able to get sleep, what improvement did you see in her daily life? Uh, just she was able to sleep. sleep. I mean, I couldn't do it the night parties. I'm so, I need my sleep. So, um, yeah, we tried, we tried a series of other drugs and nothing worked. Melatonin didn't work. Ativan didn't work. Um, I don't remember at the time because she was only two, but sure. clorazepate has been our miracle drug. So I just want to let everybody know in the room that has children that aren't sleeping. Great. So Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we have a pair of comments up here in the front, and then, oh. Yeah. All right, while Dan's running, let's take this comment right here. Landon Church, okay. Landon okay. is my son, age nine, I'm Miriam You're next. and Atlanta, Georgia. Um, real quick on the Epidiolex, we started about four months ago. It's reduced uh, GI issues and um, had a significant improvement on cognitive uh, behavioral. Uh, in, in other words, when uh, for me, when I come by Landon now, he actually reaches out for me and puts his arm towards me, which is an enormous, you know, obviously improvement for him from a cognitive perspective. Um, and he knows that I'm there. Um, the other novel therapy I, I kind of want to put forth as far as physical therapy goes is the um, intensive physical therapy. And to give you a perspective about how important this is to us, Landon was uh, first able to qualify it at 36 inches of height when he was about three years old. So we started him, they call it the TheraSuit therapy. Um, it's, um, we did a modified program. It's two hours, three times a week um, for about eight weeks at a, at a shot. Um, we were driving about an hour there and an hour back in full traffic. And it was so important to us. We did it for six years in a row. Um, until they kicked us out of the program because he has a chronic condition, they wouldn't, they couldn't hold a space for him for because kids with surgeries uh, required priority. So. What we took away from that, though, was a home care program. And in that home care program, they have what's called a, a STEM therapy program, where you put, if, if you've had physical therapy, like on a sprained ankle or something, they use ice and they use stimulation, neuroelectrode stimulation. And so we bought a machine, hook them up to it twice a day. And it's really helped him to uh, increase his head control. And with increased head control comes increased respiratory um, secretion management, um, upper GI, lower GI motility improvements. So um, it's something that we've really, you know, enjoyed. We, it's an activity that we do it together yeah. in the family. Um, so I just wanted to add the, the STEM, STEM therapy. Sure. Thank you so much. All right. So we'll come here and then right here in the front. I wrote down some things that I need to say. My name is Liam Fredericks. I am nine years old. My and my brother is my younger, and Miles is my younger brother. Miles has changed our life by helping meet amazing people that can help us improve Miles's future by making it so that he can work towards doing things other typical developing kids can do. These people are therapists teachers, doctors, and other f families and friends. Sometimes my little brother Miles stops breathing. I'm worried that he will choke. I get anxious that he could have a very big seizure and he could end up in the hospital for a very long time. I'm anxious and I'm curious about when my brother goes to the hospital with my mom. With my mom. About what's going to happen 
husband, and when my brother goes to the hospital for a checkup because I don't know what's going to happen. I want to know everything. Oh, Liam, thank you so much. <laughs> You're a good big brother to, to be, you know, so, um, have so many insights into his experience, and so thank you for sharing that so much. And so uh, before we give this comment, I just want to prime everyone else. Um, do want to broaden the conversation to also uh, include the other side of, of, of the coin, which is any uh, downsides uh, to the treatments that you've experienced either currently or in the past. So in addition to what worked well, uh, perhaps maybe what has not worked so well or what have been the biggest downsides you've experienced. But please go ahead. I think actually I'm going to piggyback very nicely. Um, I was going to talk about something that's not listed, but peer and sibling interaction is probably one of my daughter's biggest motivators. She is most likely to take advantage of the things that she's learned in physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, vision therapy. When she is interacting with her sisters, with our neighbors, um, she just comes alive and she is, um, it's just so important for them to, to have peer and sibling interaction. So while it's not a therapy therapy, it's, it's a really important part of, of our lives. Absolutely, thank you so much. Other thoughts? Uh, good or bad about current treatments? So I wanted to talk about a therapy that Lena really enjoys. I don't think we found a miracle therapy. Um, nothing has stopped her seizures um, for prolonged periods of time. Nothing has stuck because we've been through periods where she lost everything and then we had to regain and a lot of things we haven't and we're still working on. But for her water therapy, we can tell every single time we manage to get there and we don't have a pool in our town, so we have to drive about 40 minutes, 45 minutes to get to the pool, and 45 minutes back. So, And we were discharged because she wasn't showing progress, and the medical model requires progress in order to be kept in treatment. So now we were told to wait a few months and request a new referral. However, every time she was in water therapy, even the one time she was extremely fussy, you could tell she really enjoys it. It usually helped calm her down, and she learned to do things in water that then she was able to transfer on land that we'd never seen her do before. For instance, um, moving. So learning that moving her body is an enjoyable experience. She was a lot more um, still <laughs> before we took her to the pool. And then we noticed that she was starting to move in her playpen on mm. land, uh, move her limbs, maybe even try to roll or um, reach. <laughs> Yes. which she started to do first in water. And it was really, really exciting for us to see those developments. And I have actually been taking her to the pool after we were discharged just to try to get those same benefits. Cool. Something that was positive and negative, unfortunately, was the ketogenic diet. So we do not want to take her off of it. And we started it at six weeks. We were required to stop breastfeeding, which was absolutely heartbreaking for us at that time. She was six weeks old and we were in the hospital. And uh, we did notice an improvement in her cognitive abilities, in her attention, in her awareness. The seizures were never completely gone for long periods of time. I think the longest was 12 days that we had seizure freedom. But we are not taking her off like it was said before because we don't want to lose <laughs> the potential cognitive benefits. However, when we increased the ratio, she stopped seizing completely and we thought this was our miracle until she stopped eating and she became overketotic, acidotic, hypoglycemic. We ended up in the hospital, had to take her off of that ratio down to the older ratio. She started seizing immediately, but she went back to eating. Right. Another drug like that was Sabril. She stopped seizing on Sabril. Four days later, she was still refusing water, any liquids, any food. We took her off. The next day, she started eating. So anything that could have possibly been a miracle for us actually proved to be very detrimental. <laughs> So we are very much looking forward to something that will give us, like I said before, not just seizure control, but a better quality of life for her. Something like the water therapy. Yes. <laughs> something that she enjoys and can give her benefits. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll just pass it right up. Hi. Um, so our Lulu has therapies basically every day for a few hours. You know, and I feel it's such a blessing that we're able to give her the therapies that she needs. But the problem is, uh, 
it takes a turn on her social life. So, you know, she misses out on spending time with her siblings or, you know, going with us to, to places. So it's, it's a balance, you know, you, you get all these therapies and they're, you know, you feel like your child's getting ready for the Olympics or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, you know, it's, it's what we need to do until we have some kind of treatment or hopefully one day a cure and to just give them better quality of life. Because, uh, for, for example, if, if we don't do the physical therapy, I can just leave my child rolling on the floor all day. Mm. So it's just a way of getting her to move. And then you can see the children enjoying being moved, whether they're you know, taking steps or helping them sit up. So um, there's all, it's a balance. Uh, but we keep going as long as she's enjoying it and you know, she so shows progress. Sure. Thank you. No, thank you very much. We'll come here and then over to Karen. Right here. I made it complicated. At the Olympics. Hi, so I just wanted to speak to two of, I guess, the downfalls to mm -hmm. therapies. Sure. Um, first and foremost, the amount of time it takes to get equipment. Um, we have started we, we actually start, we've learned to start a year ahead of the time when Haley needs a new chair or needs new orthotics because it takes that long for her to actually get the new product. Mm. Um, it, as well as that, I mean, putting a ramp on our house, it took six months of planning and then another year and a half for it actually to get on the house. Mm. Um, the other piece is the anti-epileptic meds where frequently, as, as my dad had said, you know, they... 16 different meds. Um, the side effects of the meds we have found to be more, have more effect on her than the actual anti-epileptic effect. Mm. Um, and what I mean by that is the drowsiness, that you know, you lose that clarity with the medications. Even if you gain seizure control for a week or two weeks, or you know, if you're really lucky, a whole month, um, you lose that clarity and the interaction that with, with the kids. And I think that's probably the hardest part of, you know, you have to weigh, do you want your child to have that quality of life and to be interacting and eating and, you know, functioning with you and have some quality of life, or do you want them to not be seizing? Um, that's part of why I said that, you know, the seizures don't bother her anywhere near as much as not being able to interact with the family. Sure, thank you very much. We'll take one more comment and then we're gonna go to another polling question. Um, I was just going to comment one negative thing, like you were mentioning. So one of the one of the medications we failed on was valproic acid, and interestingly, it actually did reduce her seizures. It seemed a little, but I didn't tell any of her teachers or therapists. Anytime we started anything new, I didn't tell anyone so I could get unbiased feedback. And the teacher and the therapist were saying her eye contact is amazing. Mm. It's like her attention span is better. And that was great. But she had a very strange and evidently rare vestibular reaction, mm. and she stopped walking. So which would you rather, walking or attention span? Mm. So that was the drug we weaned. But the one other therapy that I haven't heard mentioned that I want to bring up is music therapy. For us, that is the one therapy that Samantha consistently meets her goals in. She, they're constantly reevaluating and making new goals. It's the one consistent therapy, no matter, even if she's had seizures, when that music therapist comes in, she will participate. She will pay attention. She will love it. Sure. That's all. Thank you. I saw some nodding heads with the music therapy, so... Uh, so we have uh, a pair of polling questions that are going to help wrap up our conversation of current therapy and get us thinking about future treatments and what it, all, what it is that you would prefer um, to see in a future treatment. So if we can go to our uh, third polling question for this topic. So thinking about all of the different medications, all of the different treatment approaches, that we've talked about in the polling questions you all have shared so much about. Can you uh, answer this in general? How much have all of those helped improve your child's quality of life? Has there been A, no change, B, a slightly improved, C, moderately improved, D, uh, substantially improved, or E, are you not sure whether the treatments 
have helped improve your child's quality of life. So I'll let you think about that for a minute and get your response, kind of taking into account um, all that we've talked about, uh, the, the benefits, the risks and downsides, um, you know, the improvement that you've seen, if any, you know, how much have the medications or other treatments helped improve your child's quality of life. All right, while well, final responses are, are trickling in, it looks like the uh, vast majority of our participants today um, would say that uh, currently available treatments have slightly improved uh, their child's quality of life. Um, there's, you know, about just over 10% that have said that there's been moderate improvement or even substantial improvement. Um, another 5% each have said that there's been either no change or they're not sure. So we've only seen for, in the majority of patients slight improvement, which takes us to our next question. Thinking about um, future treatment, um, so uh, what I would, uh, the question here is, uh, which ability or symptom would you rank as most important for a possible new drug treatment today? And here you can select up to three responses. Um, so given what you currently have, if you could think about what you could get from a future possible treatment, uh, what would be your top three priorities? A, reduce seizures, B, improve developmental milestones, C, improved hand function and control, D, improved walking, motor abilities, E, improved vision, F, improved language abilities, G, improved social communication, H, reduce GI symptoms, I, improved sleep, J, reduced uh, discomfort, K, reduced anxiety, or L, some other uh, uh, ability, ability or symptom that you would rank as being most important for a possible drug treatment today. Again, select your top three priorities. Just as our general reminder, you're seeing the percentages of responses, not the percentages of individuals that have selected a particular response. I'll give you just a few more moments. Looks like most results are in. Um, of the options uh, provided, uh, it looks like um, the top ranked option as most important for a possible drug treatment would be improved developmental milestones. Um, after that would be improved language abilities. And then uh, the remainder of the options are fairly close together with improved social communication, followed by improved walking motor abilities, reduce seizures, hand function and control, uh, reduce GI symptoms. Um, there are responses for each of the other uh, abilities and symptoms rank, so they are at least in some number of your top three, and no one selected something else that wasn't listed on this slide. Um, so with the remainder of our time, I wanna continue uh, this, uh, this idea and this concept in a discussion of what it is that you are looking for very specifically from future therapy. So um, the way that I'll phrase this is short of a cure, because I think that's what we all would want. Um, that would be the top of our list. But short of that cure, what is it that you would look for specifically from a next future treatment? Um, and so you know, keeping these uh, as things in mind, you know, what specifically would you look for or want um, in terms of these options or other options um, from a future treatment? and why. Yes. Sure. So um, I think, and we'll, just to echo what a lot of other parents have already said, is uh, improved communication, being able to understand your child's wants, needs, pain, uh, source of discomfort and so on. Uh, how that comes is maybe of secondary importance. If it's spoken language, of course, great, but it may be non-verbal communication. 
and that of course does overlap potentially with hand use or vision because one of those is likely to be necessary for the, a non-verbal uh, communication but I think that would really be life transforming sure thank you Majid take here and then we'll come and back to the to Senate. piggyback on what Majid said because he definitely t took the idea right out of my head but it's even okay. to extend it a little bit improved cognition I think would be really great to see so to see Lena make association to see her understand concepts or um, be able to signal that she understands who we are um, respond to her name or respond to things that are said to her so more complicated cognitive abilities um, I think would be really great would truly um, improve her quality of life because it would allow her to interact with a world that like Amanda said may not always be tolerant of kids who are different and who express themselves differently so her being able to participate more fully in a more typical way would give her more chances to, I think, enjoy her life more. Great, thank you. So we have a hand right here in the middle. Oh, you got the mic. To Vivi, who's six years old, and I would like to see improved muscle tone. Okay. I see that Vivi has intention to answer me, to move her hand on the choice board or her eyes on the eye gaze, but sometimes she has a very hard time because of her hypotonia, so. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. No, that's very helpful. So we had a hand here, and then we'll come right up front. I just wanted to add to what you had said. You know, um, what we use when we talk about Miles and Improved is meaning. We would like things to be meaningful to Miles, whether that is in choice making, communication, understanding what he wants to play with, just something that can develop some meaning for him hmm. and his understanding of the world around him. And so I think that that involves cognition, vision, hearing, the low tone, um, and the developmental. Sure. Yes. No, thank you. These different, t slightly different takes on similar interests are very important, and so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I just wanted to um, agree with her back there about the muscle tone. You know, um, like Miriam said, improved muscle tone means improved secretion management and improved physical health, and I think, you know, if you're not physically healthy, um, you know, that's kind of the primary, more and other things can sometimes be sometimes the secondary, um, especially if they create life-threatening situations. And my husband and I always comment that when Gregory has a tonic seizure, he has so much tone in his body, and I just wish that we could get that tone mm -hmm. for other, you know, other times because it would greatly improve the quality of his life. Absolutely, thank you. So what else, oh, we have a hand back here. Hi, I'm Mark, Avery's father. And I agree with everyone in the room. I think important drugs to look into more is for communication and vision and motor abilities and not to chase the seizures. I learned that a long time ago with Dr. Davinsky. Also, um, the seizures will come and go. All our, most of our children have seizures. They continue to change over the years. Avery's 11 now, and we've seen every kind of seizure under the sun. But we don't chase the seizures. We don't push the medication to the limits. We try to keep her on low doses of medication. And the Epidiolex has been wonderful. But the seizures we've learned will come and go. And let's work on some of the other stuff and see what happens. And what would you describe as what would be a meaningful improvement for Avery? Communication would be huge for her to tell us how she's feeling, what she needs. Um, she had a, a ruptured eardrum a week ago. and. We found out about it and we felt terrible. It probably happened days prior and we didn't know about it and that was devastating for us, a small thing like that that she couldn't even tell us that her ear was hurting her. But that was very difficult. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. I'll take a comment here and then was there a hand in the middle or no? Okay, right here. I'm Cynthia again. Um, reiterating on what everybody is saying on the communication, I think not only for our ability to help our child, but you know, we have, you, you've got the soulful approach and the motor approach. And our children are incredible human beings, and I think that gets overlooked. We, we have our children who are looked upon as objects and problems to solve. 
when really they're human beings and lovely souls and beautiful people and they're trapped. And from a communication point of view, not only for them to be able to communicate to us how they're feeling in, 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 in painful moments when we can't help them and we have to try and figure it out. I want them to be recognized as people and human beings. And when we are out in the world, in society, when we take them to malls and we get complaints, um, honestly, I take those as opportunities to teach the public and I purposely take my daughter to places and make people get uncomfortable so we can be conversations and raise awareness. Um, but I really communicate in, and bring out the human in them. Thank you, Cynthia. We have time for one more comment. We'll end with Ed. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to reaffirm what she just said about uh, putting your children out there. Um, they are human beings, and they all really yearn for inclusion. Movement, obviously, will give them some inclusion. For Haley, simply to be able to have a little more hand control and arm control and str shoulder control would mean she'd be able to move the wheelchair down the hallway to the school and not be left behind or follow you to the kitchen. It's not much of a deal. Maybe she won't be walking, but she'll be moving. The other part about it is I, I've noticed a lot of people were talking about yearning for communication. And I remember early on when we noticed Haley wasn't being responsive. And as I recall, it was probably 15, 16, 17 months, wasn't responding normally. And I don't know how we expressed our concern for one another, but I know I was concerned. And I made up a therapy on my own. Um, I took out pictures. And I put them in front of me. And I separated them by, you know, six, eight inches. I said, which one is mom? If the head went to mom to the left, hey, I know she's hearing me. And I know she knows which picture. And the accuracy was, you know, superb while she was having seizure retired. Now, she had no visual impairment, obviously, seeing. But you got hard and soft and feeling if you're dealing with vision impaired. And the other thing I noticed after inquiring to other parents that are, you know, overwhelmed by physical things is... Uh, just a child's lack of communication may be represented intentionality. They're busting your stones. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Uh, a common piece of language with Haley is you're changing her diaper. She's getting big. You know, it's hard to get the diaper underneath her butt. So you say, butt up. She doesn't move. Butt up. Hey. Only putting the diaper on, you're not going to the mall. Okay, butt comes up. I mean, it's... <laughs> but... I, you know, I'm making fun. It is funny, but there's a lot of receptive communication there that you really have to go for. Unfortunately, we live in a world where the therapies around are, they're not used to working with our children. So even if you get a well-intentioned, educated therapist in the house, they may not even be as capable as you are of making up stupid little things like that, like butt up and mom left, you know, dad right. And what's important about that is again, we have to look at them as not being the problem, but the opportunity, and they are there. And there is some way, and I thought today about the old book, if you really want to know what a struggle is, read the book about Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan, and you'll know people who persevered you know, through this. So at any rate, thank you. They are all there, and yeah. we got to go look for it. Thank you, Ed. So this brings us to a close of uh, the portion of the agenda um, where we've gotten to learn and hear and really appreciate from you all so much about what it is to live life with CDD, um, particularly throughout the, the topic one discussion. I couldn't keep track of the number of times uh, that you all, parents of, of individuals with CDD, talked about how heartbreaking it was, or is, for you all to see your children um, and the, the different burdens and health effects that they're suffering from. Um, and I think uh, you all should feel uh, 
so proud that today that you were able to share that heartbreak. I felt it. I'm sure everyone else here in the room felt it. But it was pulling back that curtain and sharing that those difficulties, that heartbreak, that are, are going to be what allow us to move forward. We're going to now know what to target with therapies. We're going to know what is meaningful to you all when we see it from therapies. So I just want to thank you for spending this time with me as your moderator and sharing all that you did this afternoon. So give yourselves a round of applause. So now it's my privilege to inv uh, invite to the stage uh, our, one of our closing speakers who will be providing some summary remarks, my friend and colleague, Larry Bauer. Uh, Larry is the perfect person to um, share some reactions and thoughts from what he heard throughout the day. Uh, he recent re re recently t retired from the government where he spent uh, many years first at NIH as a research nurse and then at the Food and Drug Administration where he worked for 10 years in the rare diseases program within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming Larry to the stage. Well, uh, I want to say thank you to James. Um, I'd like to... Uh, thank a couple other people in the audience. Uh, one is, the, I'd like to thank the FDA staff that made it out today to come and be part of this meeting. Um, the FDA staff, as you notice, have not contributed to this meeting, but have all been here in listening mode to listen and learn. Um, in the rare disease space, as we've heard, there's over 7,000 rare diseases. And when you work at the FDA and you're reviewing new treatments for rare diseases, oftentimes the staff have to learn that even if you're a clinician, there's many clinicians have not seen these diseases before. So, you know, the staff at the FDA have to learn. And this has been a wonderful opportunity today for the staff to learn. And I'd like, could the people that are here from the FDA, could you all stand just for a second, just that we could see who's here from the agency? Yeah, so thanks again for being here. Uh, second thank you I wanted um, to make is for the planning committee for this meeting. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. So I'd like to ask the people from the planning committee. Uh, we have uh, Karen, Dan in the corner, Amanda, Anna, and James. Thanks so much. It was a lot of work, and I think that we've had a really good meeting. Um, so some of the things, I'm, I'm not going to go over all the symptoms that we've heard today, but I just wanted to make a couple points about um, some of my impressions. One of the overarching things is that uh, we heard both from Dr. Benke and from uh, Dr. Davinsky that this, you know, there's, uh, that this is a specific and unique disorder that's different from all other neurologic disorders. Um, some of the things that make it unique, I think, are the, the refractory nature of the seizures that I've never heard anything like this before in my career about uh, seizures that are so resistant to, uh, to, to treatment. Another thing is that all of the different systems, it's not just, this is not a seizure disorder. This is a disorder that affects many body systems. And as we heard, some of the things that, the, that you families would like to see most are not, of course you would like to see seizures controlled, especially when we hear about someone that has seizures that last for 15 to 20 minutes. It's just unimaginable. Um, if you've ever been around someone with a seizure, even just you know 30 seconds seems like a long time, but to have a seizure for 15 or 20 minutes is just incredible. Um, and I think one of the, the big takeaways for me too was that uh, the things that seem to matter most are things about communication, um, being able to use our senses fully to express being human. These, most of the things I hear that you want are related to quality of life, the ability to use your hands, to make gestures, to indicate anything, the ability to use your eyes to just uh, indicate anything, you know, that, that something, is, you know, anything that you want to communicate through your eyes. 
imagine being able to use your voice to communicate. Um, it's, actually, it's very painful today to hear some of the disconnect that parents feel with their children because of these communication disorders uh, and, and those kinds of aspects. So it, it looks like when we hear about the treatments and some of the treatment failures, it looks in the future, as we look to the future, I think that it would be great if any one of these symptoms, if, if a treatment was developed for any of the symptoms, that could have improvement, whether it was for GI disorders, for bone, you know, some of the bone problems, for communication, for cognition, any improvement symptomatically would be a step forward. But I think what we are all here really looking for eventually is for a disease-modifying treatment that gets to the underlying cause. And I hope that um, on this journey forward, this very circular journey that, that you all are on, that we're all on together, I hope that that's the outcome. And I just wanted to close with um, some of the words that we heard from Haley and her grandfather when she said, uh, we are in here. See us for our potentials, not our symptoms and limitations. I have hope there is a light at the end of my tunnel. And Haley and Ed, I just want to say that I think we all share in that hope that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you all very much. I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker. This is uh, Majid Jafar, who is the, the head of the, the Lulu Foundation. And I hope you, for some of the staff here that don't know what the Lulu Foundation or where the name comes from, maybe you could let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So my name is, uh, is Majid. I'm co-founder, along with my wife, Lean, of the Lulu Foundation. More importantly, we're parents to Alia, who's five years old, uh, who's asleep now in, in Dubai. And uh, our story is very similar in terms of the diagnosis, seizures at 19 days old, uh, all the anti-epileptics, all the therapies, um, still no uh, speech or purposeful hand use uh, or walking, but we're very hopeful uh, and working in partnership with this com amazing community, patient community, global patient community actually. If the focus of understandably today has been on the U.S., but we had Carol Ann who, with us who is actually uh, president of the current president of the Global Alliance, which includes 18 national associations and the number keeps increasing um, daily as with the thousands of, of patients now identified around the world. Our focus is the Lulu Foundation is we're a research organization. We fund um, academic research in close to 50 labs now around the world, a majority of them in this country, but also in Europe and, and Japan. Uh, and we're also investing in various aspects to improve clinical translation, uh, such as patient uh, registry or different bits of the toolkit on the preclinical side, whether that's with particular module, model, cellular, animal, uh, antibodies, and we convene and bring together the researchers from industry and academia uh, all year with an app, uh, but two days a year uh, in person. It's actually this coming Monday and Tuesday in, in, in Boston. We've got um, well over 200 uh, registered attendees, as well as the leaders of the patient associations, and we work closely also with IFCR and, and the associations for the patient conference, which is every year in, in June, and the next one hopefully in, uh, well, will be in Houston, uh, Texas, um, in, in June of next year. Uh, Lulu is, is Alia's nickname, but in Arabic it actually means uh, the, the big valuable uh, rare pearl that you get out of, of the shells at the bottom of, of the sea. And that's exactly what we're trying to unlock, to echo the same sentiment. We're trying to unlock what we know is the, the amazing uh, inside our kids. Um, conscious of people's time, when we've come up to 5 o'clock, just wanted to echo our thanks on behalf of the organizers and the patient uh, community. Uh, the field has come a long way since we started four years ago. Uh, we now have, as we heard from Dr. Davinsky, four clinical trials going on that are potential treatments 
and we also want the cures that are going to be disease modifying and impact the things we heard today matter so much to uh, the parents and the families and the patients. I'd like to thank the organizing team again for putting this together. Uh, Larry and James have just done an amazing job. They've become part of our, of our patient family. Uh, Karen and Amanda, uh, Anna and Dan, everybody's worked very hard and, and it's really paid off. I'd like to thank again the FDA uh, attendees who are here and those who have also viewed online. We know many of, uh, are also viewing uh, through the web stream for being with us uh, in this important meeting for our community on this Friday afternoon. Again, thank the industry support, Marinus, Zagenix and Ovid uh, for supporting the travel and accommodation costs enabling so many families to be here. The family panelists, uh, above all, for sharing their stories and describing this devastating disorder far better, frankly, than any clinical published paper could do. Um, and thanks to all the families who have attended and, and shared their stories uh, in, in the open sessions as well. I thank you to the hotel team uh, for looking after us so well. And just wanted to summarize the next steps. We will be continuing to collect the voice of the patient through the online survey that was going to remain open for the uh, whole of this month. Um, and then we'll be collecting those results as well as the discussions that we've had today and, and the survey results with the voice of the patient report. Uh, and we have an objective of having that ready by Rare Disease Day uh, which is actually on Rare Disease Day uh, next year, the 29th, uh, February the 29th. I hope you will all have learned a lot today about life with CDKL5 deficiency disorder and the clear, urgent, uh, unmet clinical need. Uh, and then, and also that although seizures are a big part of our lives and we do want better treatments for those, that this is actually so much more than, uh, than seizures. And in fact, just to repeat from the last question, we had improved developmental milestones, improved language ability and social communication and motor abilities, all ranked higher than improved seizures uh, in that last survey uh, question. And that really getting to disease modifying treatments that address the global developmental delay uh, are the aspiration of our patient community. We believe it's doable with the science and the progress and the number of excellent companies, uh, not only that are in the clinic, but the ones that have active preclinical uh, programs now that we hope will reach the, the clinic uh, in the coming few years. So we very much hope to, to uh, have the FDA colleagues here with us and your colleagues and the organization busier with this disease uh, in, in the coming years. That's our. Uh, aspiration and hope as, as patient families uh, and to getting us closer to those treatments. Uh, let's do it, uh, as was said. So thank you again for all the families, all the attendees and everybody who made this possible. Uh, this is not over. This is an important milestone, an important chapter, uh, but the work is, is ahead of us. Thank you again.